Hello and welcome to my channel. This video is my entire Religion of Not Religion playlist combined into one video responding to Matt Powell's video, The Atheist Religion. I'll leave a card to the playlist for those of you who prefer to watch it that way, and just a couple notes before we begin. When I do this to older videos, I always redo the original video as the inset video and replace my 3D animated Creative Commons background with the one that was made specifically for me to avoid potential copyright problems. But apparently I saved the Adobe project for the third video in the wrong folder somewhere, and I have no idea what folder that would be, so there's a chunk in the middle here where Matt's video is suddenly full screen and I'm using a different background. That's why. That out of the way, please enjoy. Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today it's a Christmas miracle. I just noticed that Lying Liar Who Lies, Matt Powell, released another one of his movies. This one's called The Atheist Religion, and he is advertising it as a sequel to Science Falsely So Called. Powell's stuff is always so fun because he's one of the few apologists that I am actually comfortable calling a liar, as there have been several instances of him dishonestly editing people and doing things like asking questions and pretending they never answered them when they did. Anyway, I'm going to try and keep my responses to about 15 to 20 minutes, so I'm not sure how many parts this series will be, but I'm expecting to have some fun with it, so let's go! Okay, so once again we have some DVD cover art. Churches always seem to be a bit behind on the times. Hovind was talking about tapes long after DVDs were the norm, and now Powell's here with his DVD art when digital downloads are the norm, and if you still want a disc, get a Blu-ray. It's better this time than it was last time, so let's go over it a little bit. If you're listening to this as a podcast, I'd encourage you to go to the original video and just watch the first eight seconds or so to see this image. It is absolutely fantastic. So we've got Richard Dawkins dressed as a Jedi with monkeys praying to him, a TIE fighter flying overhead, and a T-Rex roaring behind him, all taking place in front of a public school. Well, except for Dawkins, that seems like a pretty kick-ass religion. Now, looking at the back, I don't want to take too much credit for this, but I do know for a fact that Matt has seen at least a couple of my videos, and for Science Falsely So Called, I may have had a bit of fun at Matt's expense for having the word color down at the bottom in a childish looking font on his cover art, and it's not there on this one. So I think he may have watched my series on him and adjusted something when he received criticism for it. Let's see if he made any adjustments that are more than just superficial. Not one Christian ever has produced evidence. He didn't either, nor can you. No one can. It doesn't exist. That's not the I debate demand tonight. that anybody, anybody in this room who calls yourself a Christian, if you think you have scientific evidence to indicate you're God, bring it. You ain't got it. I win. I love Aaron. He's this big, scary looking dude who's actually really nice. But yeah, he often uses language that expresses more certainty than I'm comfortable with, which works well for him. But I would agree with this statement. There is no scientific evidence for the Christian God. 46% of Americans believe in the creationist view. God created humans in the present form at one time in the last 10,000 years. Does that just shock you that so many people still think that? Yes, it does. Shock you. It doesn't shock me, but it's pretty troubling. It's Jordy and Bill Nye. Yay. In 2007, WorldNet Daily published an article stating, Atheists are making a concerted effort to win the youth of America and the world. Ha! Starting strong. An article from 13 years ago written by Chuck Norris, the well-respected political comment- Oh, wait. I mean Chuck Norris, the guy known for his roundhouse kicks, which is titled, How to Outlaw Christianity. And I legitimately laughed when I read through the article and got to the sentence, Richard Dawkins is on a personal campaign and militant quest to spread his name, books, and atheism all over the internet by hoping young people will post his graphics on their MySpace page. I mean, come on, get with the times. Who doesn't use an Oxford comma, even back in 2007? But I mean, this is Chuck Norris after all. Legend has it that the Oxford comma uses him to indicate a small break. And then he broke the Oxford comma, and here we are. Hundreds of websites and blogs on the internet seek to convince and convert adolescents, endeavoring to remove any residue of theism from their minds and hearts by packaging atheism as the choice of a new generation. 
I mean, most of the atheist content that I have seen is usually not so much about wiping out any trace of theism from people's minds, but rather just encouraging people to question their beliefs and to try and make sure you have a sound epistemology. If having a sound epistemology and asking perfectly reasonable questions about your beliefs is that threatening to you, then that says more about your beliefs than it does about atheism. And I say to the grown-ups, if you want to deny evolution and live in your world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. See? He just said it's fine for you to live in your own little fantasy land that denies evidence. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. Yep. It is important to give kids a proper education, or they end up like you, Matt. Someone who doesn't understand why quote mining is a problem. Well, I don't see anything wrong with quote mining. And thinks that the sun burns differently because of the air in space. But in space, wouldn't it be a different scenario based on the fact that, you know, the, 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 the space and the air in the space is much different than the air we have here? And despite these glaring deficiencies in your understanding, you've still felt confident enough in your wrong beliefs to put out a sort of documentary about why all mainstream scientists are wrong about nearly everything. The idea of deep time of this of billions of years explains so much of the world around us. If you try to ignore that, your, your worldview just becomes, your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Yup, it does. Any one area of science that creationists have to deny in order to make their worldview make sense might be sorta of plausible if you look at it just right, but when you take it all together as a whole, it is entirely internally inconsistent. Creationists will cry to the mountaintops about how we can't know for sure if radiometric decay rates are actually constant despite never having seen any of them change over the past 115 years, Meanwhile, they will call things like the recession rate of the moon constants when they demonstrably change. Charles Darwin, who everybody just seems to be a fan of in 2020, said, and I quote, Often a cold shudder has run through me, and I have asked myself whether I have devoted my life to a fantasy. Yep, he sure did write that. Darwin was a very humble man, and often made statements like that when discussing evolution with people who disagreed with him. He would explain how reasonable their position was, how well he understood why they would object to his theory, and then go on to very politely explain why he disagreed with them. This particular quote is from a letter to Charles Lyell, the geologist, who originally opposed evolution. This was him congratulating Lyell on being willing to change his mind when presented with new information, and reassuring Lyell that his change of mind has reinforced his confidence in his own theory, since such an accomplished man as Lyell found the evidence convincing. Here, let's read the very next sentence that comes right after that one. Now I look at it as morally impossible that investigators of truth like you and Hooker can be wholly wrong, and therefore I feel that I may rest in peace. Do you really think it's logical and rational to take a sticker with that man's name and put it on the back of your car and be proud to represent a man who thought he was living in fantasy land? Well, as mentioned, he didn't actually think that. That was his statement explaining how good it made him feel that others found his evidence compelling as well, because that reassured him that he was not, in fact, living in fantasy land. As to the stickers on the backs of cars, I don't have any on mine, and I've never liked bumper stickers regardless of their topics. I find the Darwin bumper stickers to be just as silly as the Jesus ones. And yeah, let's go back to Columbine in... Colorado. Oh, come on, Matt. I don't know why, but I expected better of you. You opened your last video with Columbine, and here you are opening the sequel with the exact same thing. Though, granted, there haven't been any Hitler quotes yet, so maybe you'll take a slightly different angle? But could you at least pretend to have new material? The Columbine shooters wrote before they died that what they did in killing their fellow students and teachers they did it because they were taught evolution at the Columbine High School. Well, that's interesting. I found the transcriptions of their journals and searched through them for evolution and Darwin. 
Neither journal contained a single mention of either. They did both mention developed in their journals, one to say that he thought all of human civilization should be wiped out, using it in the same way that we might refer to developed or developing nations. The other used it in a way that is easier to look at as potentially a product of evolution, but he always surrounds it with flowery religious language, talking about God and the eternal struggle of good versus evil, or saying that he hopes that after he dies he will find peace. So, if you want to take this as evidence that being taught evolution in school led to what they did, then I can take it as equally, and realistically probably stronger, evidence that he believed in God, therefore having a belief in God leads to school shootings. But Grady here is speaking as though they laid it out plain as day, as though they wrote somewhere, because Mrs. Smith taught me evolution, I decided that killing them all was the only option. But that is simply not the case. They decided that their fellow students and teachers were inferior, and therefore they had a right to blow them away. One of the two of them decided that he was superior to them without reference to evolution. The other just wanted to burn it all down and thought all of humanity should be wiped out, again with no reference to evolution. This is the consequences of evolution. They should have a name for it when you argue based entirely on what you think the consequences of something being true would be, rather than basing your argument on what actually is true. It's an argument using consequences. So maybe an argument from consequences. Nah, that's too obvious. Now, there are times when arguments from consequences are appropriate, but that's usually when doing things like making moral or ethical choices or in politics when setting policy. Not when discussing whether or not a scientifically supported hypothesis or theory is true. Richard Dawkins recently said that religion poisons the mind. Yeah, it definitely can have that effect. And I think the Young Earth Creationist movement is an excellent example of that effect. No matter how well supported evolution and old ages for the Earth are scientifically, because of the predetermined belief that the Bible has to be literal and that the Earth has to be less than 10,000 years old, they cannot even begin to consider the possibility that they might be wrong, leading to the unwarranted overconfidence that has the effect of making people like Matt here feel like they have enough information to make multiple documentaries on subjects that they are entirely and obviously clueless about. Really, is that why 97% of school shootings are carried out by atheists? What is your source for that number? I feel like you just pulled it out of your ass, especially considering the fact that you can't even keep it straight. Well, it's amazing to me. Is that why 99% of school shootings are done by atheists? So which is it, 97% or 99%? But let's ignore that. When looking into it, I find that it is way more complicated than just what religion the shooter professed. For instance, shooters often express feelings of loneliness and of not belonging. If you are growing up in a Christian culture as an atheist and everyone around you is trying to pressure you to believe the same way they do or else you'll burn in hell for all eternity, do you think that might be a contributing factor to the feeling of loneliness? Do you think running around equating everyone who doesn't believe in your god with school shooters will make these feelings of loneliness go away? No, Matt. You are part of the problem here. Yet Christians have their minds poisoned according to you, yet Christians have never committed such an act. So we're just going to pretend that abortion clinic bombings aren't a thing, or at least weren't motivated by religious belief? Going to pretend that things like the Christchurch mosque shooting never happened? Here's the thing, Matt. When I see a shooting happen, I realize that there is more at play here than just religious belief or lack thereof. Certainly they can and do play a role, but usually it's more that the shooters are radicalized and socially isolated. My main point here is that both Christians and atheists have carried out radical violence, so if you want to use that as an argument against atheism, then it works just as well against Christianity, if not better, because the Christian terrorists actually explicitly give religious reasons for their actions. Why would you say that Christians have their minds poisoned, yet atheists lead the world in suicide, school shootings, alcohol abuse, and drug abuse? And you want me to believe that religion is what poisons the mind. Matt, come on. Put at least a little bit of effort into remaining internally consistent. You have titled this video, The Atheist Religion. That suggests that you are trying to convince us that atheism is a religion. But you can't even manage to keep that idea consistent with everything else that you say. So, does religion poison the mind, or does atheism? 
The fact that you are even asking that question betrays the fact that you don't actually believe that atheism is a religion, or it would be a nonsensical question. Now, to address your claims, the suicide one is wrong, clinical depression is a stronger risk factor for suicide attempts than religion, and it looks as though having a religious affiliation increases the risk. We've already talked about school shootings, now how about drugs? Well, studies have shown that a religious and strict upbringing do not affect a child's likelihood of partaking in drugs or alcohol as teenagers, and as far as recovery goes, it's a mixed bag. Some studies find that there is no link, some find a negative link, and some find a positive link. Notably, a lot of the ones that found a positive link did so by asking people who went through AA's 12 steps whether or not they had a spiritual awakening while they were recovering. Not only is spiritual awakening very poorly defined, but the 12th step of AA is to have a spiritual awakening. Seems to me that would skew the results a bit. So there is no evidence to support what you're saying here, and it's possible that religion also has a negative impact, though it does bear mentioning that there were other studies that found a positive impact on religion and recovery, but they didn't so much focus on the subject's beliefs, rather focusing on how often they attend religious services, which suggests to me that having a supportive community is the main factor in helping that person recover, especially since the effect is independent of which religious affiliation you have. You'd think if it were God protecting his people from falling into temptation, then the churches that don't believe in the same god as you would have similar rates as those dirty, dirty atheists. Well, shit. Here I thought this might have been a departure from your last video style and would actually just, you know, get to the point. I guess I should have been tipped off that this wouldn't be you doing any quality work by the six minutes of opening credits that this thing has when there's only about ten seconds of credits worth of names. And the biggest problem that I've noticed with atheists is that they don't really come asking questions. They're not curious people. They're actually anti-creation. Okay, but can we just talk for a moment about how you just called Raw Matt, a guy who at one point has been a breatharian, a creation scientist in your title card? Like, I can't even find out what scientific degree this guy is claiming, but his doctorate is apparently in divinity, which is definitely not a science. But no matter the qualifications, if you have to stoop low enough to be calling a guy who thought it was possible for the human body to be fully sustained off of nothing but breathing air a scientist, then that does not bode well for the quality of your arguments. But just to address what he said there, I came to atheism from a place of curiosity. I was a Christian, and I wanted to learn more about God and the Bible. What's more, I was a creationist, and thought for sure that God created the earth and life on it pretty much as it is. But this curiosity is what led me away from religion. And I know this is anecdotal, but it's a pattern that I see. People become atheists when they become curious and want to know more about their religion, and then find the answers to be insufficient. Who is it that says we don't need to research the origin of the universe because they have a book that already gives you the answer of magic? The non-creationists are curious about what caused the Big Bang and how the Big Bang even works. The creationists insist that there was no Big Bang because this book said so. And please note, I am specifying creationists here because I recognize that it is not a dichotomy between creationism and atheism. There are plenty of Big Bang affirming Christians out there. I mean, it was a priest that first proposed the Big Bang. If we were just anti-religion, we'd reject the Big Bang because it came from a religious guy. But if you bring evidence to the table, then we listen. If they didn't believe it, they wouldn't care. They would literally be off living their own life, doing what they enjoy. But the fact that they're so triggered by it means that they know it's true, and it aggravates them. It penetrates deep. Truth always does. Truth hurts. Um, phrasing? So, atheism is a religion because atheists are all secretly young earth creationists, but they don't like that they are young earth creationists. That's the line of reasoning here? Come on, do better. I skipped it, but they literally just played a clip of a guy supporting Obama because Obama would not push for young earth creationism to be taught in classrooms. If you can't figure out why we actively counter creationist nonsense from that clip, then I don't know if I can help you, but I'll give it a go. You see, we live in this thing called a society. In a society, your actions will have an effect on other people's lives. So when you take actions that will demonstrably harm other people based on incorrect beliefs, such as teaching children the anti-science of creationism in the science classroom, then we don't like that. So we push to make sure that the harmful actions you want to take are not allowed. Or we push to help reverse the indoctrination process for people so that they can take better actions in the future. This isn't really that hard. 
If I believed that God exists, and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it. Which is a fair point. The God of the Bible is described as a genocidal maniac with severe narcissism who only threatens to torture you for all of eternity because he loves you and wants to scare you into doing what he wants you to do. Now, personally, I couldn't say for sure what I would actually do if that god were demonstrated to exist. I'd be terrified, sure, I might even be scared into going through the motions of worshipping, but I couldn't actually feel anything approaching love for such a being, and surely such a god wouldn't be fooled by mere lip service. Aaron Ra recently said, if it was the god of the Bible, someone asked him, if it was the god of the Bible, and it was proved to be the God of the Bible. Would you serve him? He said, I would not serve it. Yes, that is what he said, Matt's dad. And you seem rather upset about God being referred to as an it rather than a he. Does that mean that you believe that God has a penis? Actually, with reference to this, I've usually heard apologists say something along the lines of, it's not about having a physical penis, it's that God has a masculine nature. Which seems to me like an accidental admission that gender and physical sex don't necessarily line up with each other, and that your gender identity and preferred pronouns don't have to match up with your physical body. Also, why are you sitting at the mini president desk out by a cornfield? Did you see the president's press conference at his cute little desk and decide that you could one-up the ridiculousness? Also, also, I believe this is the first time in this movie that we've seen Tommy McMurtry, who may or may not be sexually attracted to pumpkins, and is definitely not affiliated with TommyMcMurtry.com. Talk about hatred for God! Wouldn't serve it. Well, I can't speak directly to Aaron's emotions, as I am not him, but it sounded to me more like a lack of respect for a fictional character, coupled with anger toward people who want to make important, life-changing decisions for other people's lives based on what this fictional character supposedly wants. They go out on the street, these atheists, and they hold up signs, and they say, like, free thought, good without God, and, and they hold up all these signs, do you know how ridiculous that would look if we did that? Yeah, Matt, I do know how ridiculous that would look. Because you, or people with beliefs that are very similar to yours, do that on a regular basis. Look at me, everybody, I believe in science. Like, who's going to take you seriously if you do that? I'm not even sure what to say here. Like, yeah, you would look ridiculous holding up a sign that says you believe in science, because you've made it quite clear from your videos that you do not believe in science. But sadly, in the US, belief in science is not as prevalent as it should be. I mean, sure, you and your ilk like to say that you believe in science, but then you cherry pick which science to accept based entirely on what your unscientific holy book has to say on certain matters. So no, you don't believe in science. I, that's weird, isn't it? But it's because there, no alpha male would ever do that. It figures you would subscribe to the outdated false dichotomy of alpha and beta males. Ironic, too, as you normally exhibit traits that would typically be considered beta. I mean, I know you're different in private based on this recording of you. Dude, you will go to hell! I am not joking! Look at me! You are insane! You think I am yelling too hard? You have lost your mind! But still, you present as beta in public. They're an organization, they're a group of people, they all tend to think the same way. Yup, we all sure do think the same things all the time. That's why you never see schisms in the atheist community, no sir. Stuff like that never happens. I mean, sure, generally speaking, atheists do tend to be more left-leaning politically, but the reason for that isn't because there is some atheist authority telling us that this is what to think, it's because once you get away from an authority saying things like homosexuality is evil, for example, it turns out that there's really no rational reason to not accept homosexuality. Same goes for a lot of the other issues that tend to get divided up between right and left. The only reason to be on the right-wing side of a lot of these issues are religious in nature. Now that being said, of course right-wing atheists exist. I'm sure there are already at least a few comments on this video already complaining about my saying that atheists tend to lean left and that the reason for this is a lack of religious authority. They're busy typing right now that they lean right and don't need no stinking god to tell them what to think on political issues. But yeah, we all think the same.
And matter of fact, atheist churches are opening up everywhere. The Atheist Church is launching 35 new services in cities across the world. Yeah, there are some atheist church services, which is basically an attempt to capture the feeling of community that comes with belonging to a more traditional church, but without the religious aspects of it. It's funny, in one of the articles I read on the atheist church services, there appears to be a lack of consensus as to what they even are when a reporter interviewed various members of the congregation. Some would gleefully call it a church, others would insist that it's not a church. This is exemplified in the statement, Jones insists that he is not trying to found a new religion, but some members of his congregation disagree. The congregation of this religion disagree with the founder about whether or not they even are a religion. Now tell me more about how we all think the same. Atheism, remember, is a very small demographic. They only consist of about 5-7% to 7 of the entire world's population. So, arguing based on popularity? Christianity is the number one religion in the world, therefore it's true? I'm not sure what you're trying to gain with this argument here. Like, there are an estimated 450 to 500 million people worldwide who, when asked about whether or not they think a god exists, would answer no. Which means that there are more people in the world who do not believe in a god than there are Americans in the world. If you include people who just say they are non-religious, there are over 700 million of those just in China. But if we just keep it at the 450 to 500 million number, then yeah, percentage-wise it's less than 10% of the world population. What's your point? That we can be ignored because you outnumber us? They're very, very small, but yet they lead the world in the worst statistics that you can possibly lead the world in. Yeah, we sure do lead the world in all the negative statistics. That's why the prison population is about 0.1% atheist, while the general population is 3.1% atheist, right? That's depression, medication intake, suicide, and school shootings. The link between religion and depression is far from confirmed. Studies come back with mixed results. A meta-analysis of 444 studies on the matter found that 60% of the studies reported less depression and faster remission from depression in more religious individuals. And the funny thing is, this beneficial feature of a religion is independent of which religion it is. The studies usually conclude that it's the feeling of belonging and having a supportive community that are the main factors there. You'd think that if there were one true religion, then that would be the one that saw all these benefits that you're suggesting that they have, while all the others would have similar depression rates as atheists. But no, you see strong community bonds playing the most important role, not God belief. Now, medication intake by itself is not indicative of anything. For example, if a bunch of people are prescribed antidepressants, who is going to be taking them more? The atheist who is accepting of the science behind the antidepressants? Or the person who goes to a church that insists that faith is all you need, God can heal your depression, throw those pills away? If it's five atheists and five members of a faith healing religion, then yeah, the five atheists will probably be taking more medication, even if the diagnosis rate were exactly the same between the atheists and the non-atheists. As to suicide, it's complicated. Some studies have found religion to be protective against suicide attempts, but a risk factor for ideation. Others still have found it to have no effect. One in particular, when looking at the link between suicide depression and religion, found that religion is a risk factor for people with depression. And as with the link between depression and religion, the link between suicide and religion comes down to belonging to a supportive community as being the important factor, not the religion itself. As to school shootings, we covered that in part one, but just a quick recap. In a surprise to nobody, it is quite a bit more complicated than just, this person had this religion and shot up a school, therefore they go in this little box. They'll say, well, believing in Jesus is like believing in Lord of the Rings. Well, why is it that nobody's writing against Lord of the Rings? Because there aren't significant numbers of people lobbying the government to make legislative changes that have a direct impact on our quality of life based on information found in Lord of the Rings? If there were, you can bet your ass that these same people would be out there protesting it the same way they protest you, Matt. Why is it that nobody's writing books against Santa Claus? Yeah. Well, they are, but they work for your team. Here's an article on AIG's website all about the dangers of celebrating Santa Claus over Jesus and idolizing him. So, stuff like that is silly because... Why is it that there are millions of people who make it their mission to write against somebody who they claim is nothing more than a fantasy? 
So by implication here, the people over at Answers in Genesis must really believe in Santa Claus as presented in today's Santa mythology. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother writing about him, right? What about you? You keep on putting out video after video about evolution, something you don't believe in, or at least claim not to believe in. Is this an admission that you know deep down in your heart of hearts that evolution is true? Because otherwise, why waste all your time and effort making videos and preaching sermons about it? What about atheism? You have a whole video right here over an hour long about why atheism isn't true. You've spent a lot of time on this. Why waste all that time and effort on something you don't even think is true? Clearly, deep down, you really know that it is true. Either that or this is just a stupid argument that doesn't work because there are valid reasons to argue against positions even if you don't personally believe in the position that you are arguing against. Maybe we can get to the bottom of why you feel like the way that you feel, and maybe that's probably the reason you don't believe in God. Not because of the evidence, it's because of the way that you feel. Okay, what do I even do here? You guys haven't given me anything to rebut. You guys haven't brought up any evidence for anything. You have asserted that you know what all atheists feel like, and you have asserted that all atheists, or at least most of them, think and feel the same as all the rest of them. You have provided zero evidence except for some statistics that usually aren't even true, but when they are true, they're a lot more nuanced and complicated than you are presenting them. I'm not raging against you here, guys. I'm just waiting for you to give me something that I can actually do some research on. You have to have faith that there's a Big Bang because you've never seen it. There's no evidence of it. See? That's the stuff I'm waiting for. The evidence for the Big Bang includes, but is not limited to, the expansion of space-time, the existence of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and the observation of phenomena whose existence was predicted based on models using the Big Bang as a starting point, like gravitational waves. Oh man, that felt good. But Sam Harris in 2006, he said this, If I could wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. Well, I'm not entirely sure that I would agree with that statement, but I can see where he's coming from. Religion has been used rather frequently to subjugate women and treat them as second-class citizens. In the Old Testament, the women are basically property, and rape is treated as a property crime against the woman's father or husband. Still today, churches like the NIFB here refuse to allow women to hold positions of leadership or to preach. Treating women like property or second-class citizens creates a culture where rape really isn't all that big a deal. I wonder if Matt here even thinks marital rape is a possibility. So the argument could definitely be made that removing religion from the equation would be better for all of humanity and women in particular than just getting rid of rape. But yeah, you're looking for the gut reaction from people who share your religious views that religion is a good thing, so the obvious answer is to get rid of rape. Also worth pointing out is that this is in your video where you're trying to convince us that atheism is a religion, but here you are showing a quote from a prominent atheist saying that he wants to get rid of religion. Because evolution is true, and because everything can create itself out of nothing, and because there is no God that's needed for anything, therefore we're just on our own, we can, we've sprouted up these new people that call themselves atheists. No, atheism is not new. It's just that now we live in a time when being an atheist is a lot less likely to get you a death sentence than it once was. Atheists have been around for as long as God concepts have been around. And also all of your therefores there were severely flawed. And they've de decided to live their life and define themselves by this term. Not really. Sure, my YouTube channel is pretty much defined by my lack of a religious position and my opposition to religious indoctrination, but in my normal everyday life, I consider labels like father to be more important than atheist. I'd rather define my life by being a good dad than by not believing in God. Meaning they don't define themselves by what they believe in or what they like. Yes, they do. They just aren't necessarily as explicit about it as religious people. And even in addition to that, there are plenty of atheists that are secular humanists, which is a group that has some core beliefs and life stances. From their website, secular humanism is comprehensive, touching every aspect of life, including issues of values, meaning, and identity. Thus, it is broader than atheism, which concerns only the non-existence of God or the supernatural. Important as that may be, there's a lot more to life, and secular humanism addresses it. They have a statement of principles akin to the core beliefs of other religions, including items like we believe that scientific discovery and technology can contribute to the betterment of human life, and we believe in the cultivation of moral excellence. You may disagree with some of the beliefs, but the fact of the matter is that atheists do have beliefs. 
And no, I am not saying that all atheists are secular humanists, but a lot are. And you just said that atheists don't believe in anything. Yet here's a group of mostly atheists who have a statement of principles that contains several belief statements. That's a whole big group of people, many of whom would agree that they are atheists, defining themselves by what they believe in, just like you said they don't. Learning this stuff is not hard. Maybe just put a tiny little bit of effort into it. They've decided to label themselves by what they don't believe in, supposedly. It's one label of many. Father, husband, musician, technology enthusiast, friend, son, lover of sweaters, the list goes on. I do not define myself by any one single label. I am a human being, and human beings are much more complex than any one label is capable of encompassing. So what they've done is they've labeled themselves by something like a non-stamp collector. Well, non-stamp collector has an excellent YouTube channel. I highly recommend it. It's not as active as it used to be, which is unfortunate. Anyway, in a video of his from 2008, he points out that atheism is a religion, like not collecting stamps is a hobby, hence the name non-stamp collector. And yes, that does indeed seem strange. Nobody would call themselves a non-stamp collector. Which is exactly the point. Most atheists don't live their lives with atheism being at the center. It's just that not believing in the same sky bully as you means that when you try to impose that sky bully's morals onto us without any reason aside from because the sky bully said so, we don't see why you should get away with that. So take for example that uh, I don't like stamps, I don't believe in them, and I don't want to collect them, so I've came up with a term that I can now define myself by not collecting stamps. It really doesn't make much sense. That depends. Are the people who do collect stamps pressuring their legislatures to pass laws that will affect the private aspects of my life that have nothing to do with their stamp collecting hobby? Maybe I prefer collecting coins to stamps. Are the stamp collectors trying to pass laws to make coin collecting illegal despite the fact that our collecting of coins doesn't impact the stamp collecting in the slightest? They even preach sermons about the evils of coin collecting, and then some of those preachers are caught collecting coins secretly themselves. These philandering philatelists are poking their noses where they don't belong, so naturally the coin collectors want to assert their right to collect coins in peace. You see how this works? It's not that hard except for unless it really bothered me and it hit me on a personal level. And that's kind of what the concept of God has done to these people. It's affected them in so much of a way that they've now labeled themselves anti-God. You're so close there, so close. It's not what God himself has done. It's what people claiming to represent God have done and are doing in God's name. If you would just philatel yourself quietly without trying to infringe on the coin collecting, nobody would have any problems, but you don't. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion, this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. That is an oversimplification to the point of error. The most egregious problem with that statement is that this is when all matter, energy, space, and time were created. That makes it sound like the Big Bang is what created all the stuff, but the reality of the situation is that we don't really know what came before the Big Bang. The singularity is one hypothesis, but it is by no means the only one. And either way, I can guarantee that Matt is going to jump on the statement that energy was created here on the grounds that this violates the laws of thermodynamics. Really, the only thing about the Big Bang that violates thermodynamics is when you misunderstand the Big Bang. So strictly speaking, with regards to what the video he is playing has just stated, he would be technically correct. That would constitute the violation of thermodynamics. But as it turns out, the statement in that video is incorrect. So the Big Bang theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton. Yeah, that's the simplified explanation, but really there are several hypotheses that don't involve singularities, and the singularity is more of an indication of our lack of understanding of physics at those scales than anything else. So sure, if you don't look any further into it than what you have just said, then you have a correct enough to teach a third grader explanation that is easy to deconstruct. And then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the size of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. Who here thinks that's just logical and scientific? Well, it's supported by the evidence, so yes, it is scientific, even if it doesn't appeal to our intuition. Your ability to phrase an oversimplification of the process in a way that makes it sound unscientific does not actually make it unscientific. 
And remember, your alternative hypothesis is that just 6,000 years ago, God made a person out of dirt, then paraded a bunch of animals in front of him to see which ones appealed to him the most, but none did. So he took one of the dirt man's ribs and made a woman out of it, and then a talking snake with legs convinced the woman to eat the fruit from the tree of everything can go fuck itself, and that's why snakes don't have legs and thorns exist and childbirth hurts. Does that sound logical and scientific? Your misunderstanding of the Big Bang sounds more plausible than what you are actually proposing. Explosions don't create natural law and order, they create chaos. Well, let's start out by playing this clip of a steel sphere being explosively hydroformed. Great, so now that we've determined that explosions can form things, let's move on to the fact that nobody is claiming that an explosion is responsible for the order and the laws of the universe, okay? But yet we have unchanging laws. Where did these laws come from? Where did they arise? Dunno. That's the real answer. We don't know. You don't know. You sure like to pretend you know, but you have no evidence to back up your assertion, so I may as well suggest that they came from the flying spaghetti monster. I mean, there are actual models for the universe that attempt to answer this question. The bouncing cosmology model, for instance, suggests that the universe is cyclical, with each cycle being mostly the same as the one before it, but also slightly different, which could mean that the universe is in a process of potentially endlessly cycling between different variants, meaning that eventually it would get to the universal variant that we currently exist in. Cosmic inflation posits that there is a cosmos beyond our universe that is going through inflation, and as it inflates, it creates offshoot universes with all of the potential values for the various constants, meaning that each offshoot universe will have slightly different laws of physics, and so we live in the offshoot universe that is capable of sustaining our form of life. The cosmic inflation model is, at this time, untestable and unfalsifiable, so it's not really anything more than an interesting thought experiment, but the bouncing cosmology model makes predictions that could potentially be tested in the future, so we'll see where this goes. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, yet in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second it went from that tiny point to something billions of miles across? Yeah, because space can expand faster than the speed of light without the things contained within this space traveling faster than the speed of light. It's not intuitive, but that's how it is. It's not even scientifically possible. You know, 326 million trillion gallons of water exist on Earth right now. So for somebody to believe that those gallons of water were all condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton, that takes great faith. That takes great belief. Sure, it would. Thankfully, though, not a single person who actually understands anything about the Big Bang believes that there was any water compressed there. Water would not have been able to exist until well after Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which is something that happened shortly after the initial expansion. And even then, you need oxygen to make water. Big Bang nucleosynthesis only got us hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium, and the beryllium that was produced then would have been unstable and would have decayed back into lithium. So no, we don't even get water after Big Bang nucleosynthesis. The first round of stars to form after the Big Bang would have produced the universe's first supply of oxygen. Only then could water form, and we're talking two to five hundred million years after the Big Bang here. Get this too. What if I said nothing caused something behind this piano to explode? What if I said nothing caused it? Then that would be silly. You'd say, man, that's crazy. That's weird. But that's literally what they believe. They believe that nothing exploded and that there was no God. So nothing had to cause nothing to explode. Let me ask you, viewer. Did anything I said in this video so far give you the impression that I believe that nothing caused nothing to explode into everything? If so, then sorry, I must have worded something poorly because that's not what most people think. Remember how Matt Powell himself described it earlier? So the Big Bang Theory states that all of the matter in the universe was condensed down to an infinitesimal amount of space smaller than a single proton, and then in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, it went from the ties of that tiny point to something billions of miles across. What part of that started with nothing? Now, if one of the singularity models of the early universe turns out to be correct, where did the singularity come from? 
we don't know. It's possible that space-time just breaks down when it gets compressed that small, making a beginning or a question of what came before a logical absurdity. It's possible that the bouncing cosmology model is correct and we are merely one of a series of consecutive universes to exist, potentially stretching indefinitely into the past and the future. And yes, one hypothesis does propose that the universe literally came from nothing. That comes from the fact that when you add up all the positive and negative energy in the universe, it appears to balance out to zero, meaning that the total energy of the universe universe is zero, meaning that the appearance of the universe out of nothing does not break the laws of thermodynamics. Big Bang Theory is just a reminder that these people have decided what truth is, and they will use any explanation that does not include God, and the fact that the Big Bang is all they can come up with, it just is a reminder to me that there is no other explanation except that there is a God, and that this is his creation. That position shows that not only do you have a piss-poor understanding of the subject, but also that you aren't even trying to learn anything about it. There are several hypotheses about the beginning of the universe that are quite different from the typical Big Bang model, and it takes almost zero effort to find them. But McMurtry here might have been distracted by some pumpkins or something, so sure, you can be forgiven for thinking that that explanation is the only one we have. But to suggest that this explanation is a result of us trying really, really hard to come up with just any old explanation that avoids positing a god betrays your complete and utter ignorance on this topic even more. The Big Bang was first proposed by a devout Catholic priest, George Lemaitre. NASA scientist Robert Jastrow was convinced by the Big Bang that there was evidence for the supernatural creation of the universe. The Big Bang is not an atheistic idea. If we were just looking for something that could omit God completely and we didn't care about any of the evidence, we probably would have stuck with the steady state model of the universe rather than going with the Big Bang. Like what if I said nothing caused something over here to explode? Okay, it's highly answer. unlikely. No, it's impossible. I would say it's highly unlikely. I would not say impossible. So this is Ethan of the Your Friendly Neighborhood Atheist YouTube channel. He seems like a genuinely nice guy. He also put out a video discussing his involvement in Matt's project here. It's about six minutes long, but let's just play a couple snippets for now. He had approached me a couple weeks before filming and uh, said he needed an atheist and no other atheist would speak to him. And he just wanted to sit down and interview someone for his upcoming movie. And I, I prefaced that with him prior to sitting down. I'm like, look, dude, science isn't my jam. I, I'm new to all of this. I am learning. So if you want to stick on science, I, I don't know how much I could contribute to that conversation. But for most of the interview, it kept going back to that and to thermodynamics. And I, sh I should have. I should have known better. But I didn't. And it's it's okay. Okay, so here we have Ethan, a guy who has informed Matt that he doesn't really specialize in the scientific areas, so he would prefer not to discuss the intricate details of various aspects of science. And here's Matt asking him science questions that he has already stated he isn't the best at answering. And of course, we already know from our history with Matt that Matt always edits his videos to make his guests look their best and brightest, right? Do you think artificial intelligence always requires a designer? Before Ethan answers, I would say that yes, artificial intelligence requires a designer of some kind. It's right there in the name, artificial. Generally speaking, when people call something artificial, they are referring to something that has been made by human beings rather than by nature. That's the primary definition of artificial. So by definition, artificial intelligence would have to be designed by human beings, or it wouldn't be artificial. I, yeah. Um. But intelligence doesn't. Like, actual intelligent beings don't require a designer. So, we don't know. And there you go. You now have a clip of a guy who told you he wouldn't know science stuff saying, I don't know, when you ask him a science question. What it really comes down to is that intelligence is actually a really complicated topic. It can be hard to figure out what intelligence even is. Is it pattern recognition? Is it the amount of trivia you know without having to look it up? Is it how quickly you can do math problems? Is it your reading comprehension level? What Matt probably really means here is just complex interactions in our brains that give us the perception of being conscious, which is a less nebulous term than intelligence. And yeah, our brains are a product of evolution. You can believe that evolution was guided by a god if you want, but this this is an unnecessary assumption. Your, your statement when you said atheists believe something came from, uh, from nothing, that's, that's not accurate. Um, I, I don't recall any ever, ever any atheist specific. I can name 10 right now that say that something came from nothing. Oh, you can name 10, can you? Okay, let's hear the list. 
do you really believe that something came from nothing? Yes. Okay, there's one. Assuming that guy was an atheist, I don't actually know who that was, so I couldn't tell you. Oh, okay. I guess we're done with that part. You could have at least added Lawrence Krauss to your list. He's the easy one. He literally wrote the book on it. So I guess that's where I'll leave it for now, too. Here's another one for you. Can't resist a headline that from the mail. Monkeys who sailed 900 miles across the Atlantic. Evolutionists also claim that monkeys, because monkeys had to have somehow gotten to South America from Africa. That's what evolutionary theory states, and, and they have a problem figuring out how. So their best conclusion that their best scientists have come up with is this idea that monkeys surfed across the ocean. <laughs> Matt, have you ever heard of the concept of steel manning an argument? That's when you try to state your opponent's case in the strongest way you think it can be stated. So when you read an article about a potential giant floating vegetation raft that transported monkeys from Africa to South America, calling it surfing is you obviously making it out to be much more ridiculous than it actually is. Now, there are a couple things I'd like to get into here. Firstly, the giant vegetation raft is not the only hypothesis. There's also the fact that there would have been more land bridges when the monkeys made their way over, as sea levels would have been quite a bit lower. Secondly, this is only a problem because of timing. Both creationists and real scientists agree that the supercontinent Pangaea was a thing in the past. So again, if we were trying to just make the data fit with what we wanted, it would be easy enough to just say that the monkeys got there when it was directly connected, and then you wouldn't need to invoke land bridges or vegetation rafts. As to the article you referenced, it was specifically about a study published in April 2020, which found fossil teeth that fit in better with old world monkeys than with new. So the question became one of how many times did a migration happen between Africa and South America? And the answer seems to be twice, and one proposed method of migration is on a vegetation raft in a time when South America and Africa were much closer together. Now that has a lot of problems. There's tides out there. You know, they probably get blown off their surf. Whoever, who has ever seen a monkey surf? I don't even think they can. I don't even think they can surf, he says in a video where he also shows footage of monkeys surfing. You didn't have to use that clip, Matt. I'm sure there were other things you could have included in there if you were really hurting to get the runtime up. Also, this makes it look like your reading comprehension really is atrocious if you're confusing massive rafts of vegetation with small surfboards. Some things come to my mind immediately. First, what would ever possess a group of monkeys to find anything of a platform and take to sea? Nothing. If you think they did it on purpose, then you weren't paying attention to any of the articles. But then again, if you're getting your information from Matt, you probably think they did it on a surfboard, so clearly actually understanding what the articles were talking about is a fairly low priority. Mats of vegetation are something that happens sometimes during wet weather, and sometimes they can be solid enough to contain trees that are still standing. If a monkey is in such a tree when it becomes dislodged and starts floating away, it could find itself stuck on this raft as it gets washed out to sea. In the right conditions, it is entirely plausible that such a raft could make the journey from Africa to South America in a time when the distance between the two was significantly smaller than it is today. Yes, it would take a combination of just the right circumstances in order for that to happen, but since we're talking about an event that happened twice that we know of in 50 million years, it stands to reason that there were many more failed raftings than there were successful ones in that time period. But no, the monkeys didn't set out to build a raft and go exploring on the open oceans. That is not what any scientist thinks, and you should be ashamed of the fact that lazy research on your part led to that line being left in your video. Secondly. How did they survive? With great difficulty. Their diet was mostly fruit, so as long as an adequate amount of fruit was caught up in the vegetation, food would have been okay, and fruit has enough water content that they might have been able to avoid dehydration, but I don't imagine it was a pleasant voyage. Now, I did a little background on this, and if you rode a canoe, you'd move at about three miles per hour. That's if you rode and you would make it across in, the, in a straight line, which is not possible, by the way, if, if you're floating, from Africa to South America, it would take you a minimum of 65 days rowing. I'm not sure how that's even relevant. 
If you do a tiny bit of research into this, which you just said you did, then you'll find that every site that gives three miles per hour as an average speed for the canoe also mentions that this is in still water with a straight line, two paddlers, and no wind. As soon as you tweak any of those parameters, the number changes. Did you take current into account with your calculation? Do you even know what the Atlantic currents would have been like in the Paleogene? Did you take into consideration that the distance would have been significantly shorter in the Paleogene? At least for the last one, I can confirm that he did not, because running the same calculation with the 2000 km distance given as the higher end of the estimate, I find that it would take 17.3 days to make the trip. Add in favorable currents and winds, and you get a potentially much shorter voyage. In the video I showed earlier of the vegetation raft, it's hard to estimate, but using the bridge it goes under for scale, I have conservatively estimated that it was traveling at about 4 meters per second, which is about 14.4 kilometers per hour, which would get you across a 2,000 kilometer stretch of ocean in just under 6 days. Of course, it would not be traveling at that speed the whole time, most likely, but a range of 6 to 17 days does not seem that far out of the realm of plausibility. Now, these monkeys have no way to propel themselves. They're bobbing around out there like a cork in the, in the ocean, and that brings to mind the perils that one experiences at sea. Yep, it was a dangerous and difficult journey, so much so that it has only happened twice successfully that we know of over a 50 million year time period. How many monkeys got washed out to sea and just died? Probably a lot more than made it safely to a new continent. Nobody's claiming it was some easy thing and monkeys are just really good sailors and it happened all the time. The surfing monkey theory is so hilarious to me, I'm almost embarrassed even talking about it. But the thing is, we have to talk about it because they're actually promoting this in so-called science books today. Okay, let me ask you a question then. If this is so utterly ridiculous, how did kangaroos get to Australia after the flood? How did sloths get to South America? Hell, what is your explanation for how the monkeys got to South America? You've got the same problem. There exists a population of animals on a continent separated by an ocean on either side from any continent that is connected by land to their point of origin. So how did the monkeys get to South America, Matt? What is your explanation? I've seen creationist explanations run the gamut from going the long way round over a land bridge in the Bering Strait, to similar though usually more ridiculous vegetation rafts, to animals actually being propelled by volcanic eruptions into their various locations. Which explanation do you favor? Now keep in mind here, there are like three groups of animals that exist in South America because of these vegetation rafts. The New World monkeys, rodents, and now this one group of Old World monkeys that ended up going extinct. Of these three groups, two of them, the rodents and the New World monkeys, likely arrived at the same time, so if it were a rafting event rather than a land bridge, that would just mean that rodents were on the raft with the monkeys. So that's two rafting events over 50 million years, which you guys are going on about how amazing it would be to survive such a journey. Meanwhile, the creationist explanation is often something similar, rafts formed from trees that were uprooted during the flood. Except you guys need dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands to millions of species to survive on such rafts in ideal conditions in order to have all gotten the unique species to their various locations, everything from the army ants of the Amazon to the koalas of Australia. Oh yeah, did I mention that koalas are actually quite stupid for mammals? They don't even have the ability to recognize eucalyptus leaves if they have been removed from the tree. So how these guys could have survived a year in a boat with no eucalyptus trees followed by a rafting journey back to Australia is beyond me. My point is, two rafting events in ideal conditions over a 50 million year period is a way more plausible hypothesis than conservatively hundreds of such voyages over a couple years after the flood. And it's just a reminder that these people, whenever there's evidence, you know, which is what science is supposed to be based off, that there is a creator, if that whenever they find evidence that disproves evolution, they go to just crazy theories like the surfing monkey theory. How exactly would the presence of monkeys in South America prove a creator? You already think that dating methods are some giant conspiracy. Would it not be easier for scientists to simply pretend that the evidence points to the monkeys having moved to South America when it was directly connected to Africa rather than come up with these crazy theories? The fact of the matter is, we don't know if these vegetation rafts actually are what did it. We don't really know how they got there, and we might never figure it out for sure. But it is a fact that they are there, and they were not there when Pangaea was a thing. 
And now we know that one group of Old World monkeys was also there, which suggests another crossing. And the only reason it suggests another crossing rather than saying they came across at the same time is because we have mapped the evolutionary relationships of these monkeys, and the teeth that were found in South America have distinctive features that place them pretty firmly in the Old World monkey category. If evolution were the lie that you claim it is, it would have been much easier just to classify these fossils as having been a new species of New World monkey, and Bob's your uncle problem solved. But they didn't do that, did they? And they come up with stuff like that, and we're supposed to take them serious, and you know, we're supposed to let them intimidate us into silence. No, you're not supposed to be intimidated into silence. Ideally, we would love for you guys to actually learn some stuff about science and maybe become productive members of society instead of being the anchors keeping us down. I would be absolutely delighted if Matt here would start actually learning how stuff works and updated his opinions and worldview accordingly. But I'm not going to hold my breath for it. On what we believe when they're coming up with stuff like that, I find it insulting and it's embarrassing that we even have to address these type of things. Well then, now you know how I feel most of the time, this time included. You know, since the two vegetation rafts over a long period of time are way more plausible than the hundreds, thousands, or even millions of such rafts that would have been needed for creationism to work? Anything's acceptable as long as it doesn't include God today. Yeah, tell that to Francis Collins. Monkeys are fairly smart, so I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Okay, it's confession time. I had never heard this idea until I got to this segment of Matt's video, and then I read through a bunch of different articles and papers that mention the subject in order to make sure I thoroughly understand what was going on, and I'm not ashamed to admit that it still doesn't seem right to me. So I'm going to go ahead and just assume that Ethan has never encountered this idea before either, and that you just sprung this on him. And you probably worded it in a way that made it sound like monkeys built a raft rather than being caught on one that was being swept out to sea, and that was Ethan's only experience with this idea. So what, you want a cookie for being able to get a guy who flat out told you that science isn't his best subject to say something that doesn't sound scientific? Squids and octopuses have a different genetic build than any other creature in the world. No, they don't. It's still DNA, similar to DNA of all other life on Earth. Same base pairs, same shared genetic material, same as everything else on Earth. So they couldn't, scientists have come to the conclusion that they couldn't have come from any other sea creature. So here's what evolutionary theory states about how they got here. Evolution says, or evolutionists claim, it says one plausible explanation in our view is that the genes are likely new extraterrestrial imports to Earth. Nope. One study conducted by a bunch of scientists who didn't see fit to include a single zoologist among their number mentioned that this is something they find plausible. Based on what, you might ask? Octopuses have more protein coding genes than humans. That's it. That's the whole basis for that speculation. They make basic mistakes in this paper about cephalopod phylogenies, and they never even specify what they mean by octopus. Are they talking about the entire genus, a specific species of octopus, a different grouping of octopuses? It's also worth noting that they came to this conclusion based on the sequencing of a single octopus genome. As of the paper's publishing, there was one octopus genome available for examination, and the rest of the cephalopods were also incredibly sparse, so they didn't really have something to compare it to. They ignored the fossil history of cephalopod evolution. They incorrectly categorized several cephalopods. They didn't define important terms that they were using. It was a terrible paper, and it was ridiculed and ripped apart by the scientific community. In fact, the screenshot in your video is from the Snopes article that debunked the claim that researchers have discovered the octopus genome contains alien DNA. I mean, they do call it mixed based on the fact that this one paper exists that does mention alien genes as a plausible hypothesis, so tech Technically, scientists did say it's a possibility, but that opinion has never been, and likely will never be, the scientific consensus. But there are some that believe that scientists and their ideas and their work is infallible. Maybe there are people that think that, if there are, those people need a better education on the scientific method. Science is a process of self-correction. Just because a paper got published doesn't mean that suddenly everybody accepts it. Far from it. For a claim as drastic as the space alien octopus claim, a best case scenario for them would be that their paper indicated that further study in that area is needed. 
However, their paper was so poorly done that further study in that area is not indicated at this time. Certainly we still have a lot to learn about cephalopod evolution and the various cephalopod genomes, but as of yet there's absolutely nothing to indicate an extraterrestrial origin for octopuses or their genes. And to that I say, nonsense. Agreed. Thinking that scientists are infallible is nonsense. We recognize that scientists are fallible, and that's why we have the peer review system. And as this paper demonstrates, it's not a perfect system, but it is the best we have. They flew here on the back of comets. That's what you believe. You believe that squid and octopus eggs were attached on the back of comets. They flew and they landed in the ocean, and then they became mortal enemies with one another. This guy is truly something else. This whole thing is something else, really. This whole segment betrays the fact that this video has been made not to convince atheists or to convert people to Matt's religion, it is to reassure people who already agree with him. So he finds a crazy sounding study that somehow made it to publication, and then he presents it as though it were the consensus because it made it to publication. And then he has Raw Matt directly address the supposed atheists in the audience to tell them that this is what you believe. A futile gesture to any atheist actually watching. You telling me what I believe doesn't actually make it so. However, someone confidently telling atheists what he thinks they believe as though they actually believe it would definitely make believers more comfortable with their stereotypical notions of what atheists are. I do need to look that up if that's true. Yeah, that's, that's what evolution teaches, is that monkeys actually got on rafts. Back to the monkeys, I guess. And yeah, there he is, telling you that he needs to look that up because he doesn't know enough to comment on it. And no, evolution does not teach that monkeys got on rafts. Creationists certainly teach that when talking about how New World monkeys got to South America, but evolution just dictates how they diversified. How they got where they diversified doesn't particularly matter to evolution. The raft thing is just one of a few different hypotheses about it. But the fact is that one way or another, they got there. Evolution literally teaches that our face and that our hair was created as a cushion and that we were actually punched to the point where natural selection had to create a cushion in our face. That is weird. Yeah, that is weird. But the weirdness of an idea has no bearing on the truth of that idea. The thinking behind that study was the fact that a male lion's mane does serve a protective function during combat, so maybe the human beard has a similar function. The jawbone is one of the most commonly fractured bones when people start messing around with each other, so it makes sense. The other hypothesis here is that it's a product of sexual selection. Enough women like facial hair enough to choose mates with more of it over mates with less of it over the years, and so it becomes a trait that was selected for. Both of these hypotheses make perfect sense. It is shocking that in 2020, with all the information that we have and the ability to Google things, that people even believe in evolution. More shocking than that are the several basic mistakes and misunderstandings that made it into the final cut of your video when a quick Google search would expose them for the mistakes and misunderstandings that they are. Except, wait, this is Matt Powell we're talking about. He probably either didn't bother looking at the information closely enough to figure out where he was wrong, or he did and chose to misrepresent it anyway. Seriously, Google the octopus thing. It is easier to find science news articles making fun of it than it is to find articles that are friendly to it. And yet, Matt here presents it as though it is the scientific consensus. They say that the reason that we lost our ape hair is because apes started sewing and knitting clothes. Well, as with most of the why questions of evolutionary biology, the answers are rather speculative. It's definitely not as simple as just having developed clothes, though. Clothes may have played a role, along with harnessing fire, but they almost certainly were not a sole factor. The most widely accepted idea is that it happened when our ancestors moved from the shady forest into an open savanna. Those of them with less body hair had an easier time with thermal regulation in the heat of the day, and so could be more successful hunters. This may also be why humans have significantly more sweat glands than the other apes. So they didn't need their hair anymore. Think about it, people. Logic. Come on. Why did it start needing to wear a jacket? An ape today doesn't need a jacket no matter where it lives. It can live in the tropics. You can put it in a zoo in the city. You can put it in the Arctic. They live out in the frost in Japan up in the high mountains and they just sit there. They don't need clothes. I like how he's literally showing a video of a monkey sitting in a hot spring to avoid the cold weather in Japan while ranting about how they're fine in cold weather. All of this is a bit of a moot point though if it were the hunting patterns that caused the hair loss rather than the clothes. That being said, most apes live pretty close to the equator. 
In fact, the Japanese macaque is the only cold climate non-human primate, and the ones that live in zoos generally have access to warm indoor areas that they can go to if it gets too cold for them. So even if you were right, you're wrong. But as it turns out, you're wrong. But does anybody actually really believe this? Like, or, or are these just theories that they throw out and hope, you know, somebody actually, you know, takes that as law? Well, if you just got the explanation of something scientific from Matt, then I feel comfortable saying, no, nobody believes this. Because that's how wrong Matt usually is. If the answer just happens to be yes, you can bet your ass he's leaving something important out. They scoff. They mock at you. But they don't even know what evolution teaches. The projection is strong with this one. This whole video so far has been Matt scoffing and mocking evolution without seeming to know even the most basic facts about it. Duck-billed dinosaurs once crossed the ocean. The first duck-billed dinosaur fossil discovered in Africa. Because Africa was isolated by the deep oceans at that time, duck-billed dinosaurs must have crossed hundreds of miles of open water. Where's their source for that? Well, here's kind of interesting in this article that I'm reading. Here's who they quote as a source. Sherlock Holmes said, I can guarantee you that is not a source. And same thing applies to these duck dinosaurs as did the monkeys earlier, except it's much more plausible because Africa would have been much closer to Europe than it was to South America when the monkeys crossed. And duck dinosaurs were most likely strong swimmers. Their fossils are often found in aquatic environments. So a few of them get swept out to sea on a vegetative raft, similar to the one seen earlier in this video. And since they're powerful swimmers, should something happen to the raft, they can make a swim for it. Events like this are not uncommon. It's how lemurs populated Madagascar. It's how small lizards hop islands in the Bahamas even today. So now let's see what the Holmes quote is. Sherlock Holmes said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. That statement, as popular as it has become, is entirely fallacious. It relies on the assumption that you will be able to somehow figure out when you have eliminated all potential options. How can you even be sure there isn't some option out there that you've just never even considered? You can't. It's not possible. So much pseudoscientific garbage gets justified with this line of thinking. It's disheartening to see legitimate scientists quoting it. Oh yay, there's a section in this one called Dinosaurs and Man 2. It's always the highest budget of films that can't think of unique titles for their sections, isn't it? The tricky thing about Schweitzer's work is that she needs to get her hands on the insides of dinosaur bones. Oh yay, soft tissue, how exciting. Yes, soft tissue was found, after the hard parts of the fossil were dissolved in an acid bath. That's when they found tiny particles that were pliable and resembled certain tissues like collagen. Now, this find has been lobbed back and forth between being most likely genuine and most likely contamination, with scientists immediately suspecting contamination when it was first published in 2005, followed by Schwartz in 2013 demonstrating the preserving effects that iron in a dinosaur's blood would have had on the tissues. Essentially, it reacted with the other molecules in the blood, causing them to behave like formaldehyde, thereby preserving the tissue and providing a likely mechanism for this preservation. But this was followed up by more suspicion of contamination based on the call collagen found being pretty much identical to ostrich collagen, leading scientists to suspect that it actually was ostrich collagen, since the lab that handled those samples also handled ostrich samples. But more recently, in 2019, Schweitzer found more soft tissue in a new fossil, and described the fossilization situation that could account for such preservation of these tissues. Notably, at no point in this process whatsoever did any of these discoveries cast any doubt on the age of the fossils discovered, or the age of the Earth in general, because we know these ages from methods other than checking for fleshy bits. It's impossible for these materials to exist in the ground for millions and millions of years, so this disproves evolution. How do you figure? That's the thing here. If you don't start with a worldview assumption, you are free to just look at the evidence. We know evolution happens for more reasons than just dinosaur fossils. We know the Earth is 4.5 billion years old through methods other than dating dinosaur fossils. If all of Dr. Schweitzer's finds turn out to be significantly younger than everyone knows that they are, 
Yes, this would be a major shakeup in the scientific community, but it would not change anything about our perception of the age of the Earth, because that was independently confirmed with multiple other methods, nor would it say anything about evolution, because that has also been independently confirmed. And really, this discovery has nothing to do with evolution. Are you suggesting that dinosaurs shouldn't have evolved collagen that is capable of lasting that long? Best case scenario for creationists here is that we have discovered a scientific anomaly. That is is the absolute best that you can hope for. That's basically nothing. And it proves that these materials are simply the remnants of creatures that died approximately 4,500 years ago. Nope. Before Dr. Schweitzer made her discovery, it was estimated that collagen could last up to 7 million years in ideal conditions. What part of that says the finding of such tissue means the animal was alive just 4,000 years ago? Dinosaur soft tissue is another example of the scientists ignoring the evidence. Here we have evidence that they're not as old as they say. That was one possibility with the find. If you find tissue that the general opinion is that it couldn't last for more than one to seven million years in a bone that was found in a rock layer that places it at at least 65 million years old, that could be one data point that suggests that these layers are actually younger than we thought. But in order to come to that conclusion, you would have to ignore the literally thousands to millions of other completely independent, well-established data points that gave us the age range that we have for the Cretaceous period. The other options are contamination or that an as yet unknown preservation method exists. Of these three options, the first one seems the least likely, and while contamination seems most likely at first, as more samples started being discovered with soft tissues, it started to look like there might be an unknown preservation method. So really what it comes down to is that we were either a bit wrong about one thing, or we weren't even close to being slightly correct about thousands to millions of things. And yet we're supposed to ignore it, because obviously, if there's soft tissue, it must last 65 million years because we know dinosaurs were 65 million years ago. Well, well, had the soft tissue been in a bone that was found in a rock layer that was much more recent than those particular dinosaurs were thought to have lived, then we might start questioning the age. Actually, in that case, we would probably have started questioning the age long before we found the soft tissue. But everything about the find seemed to fit with the 68 million year date, so the date was never really in question. Are you sure about that? Because the evidence is saying something else. No. One piece of evidence is pointing to three possibilities, one of which is that we got the wrong date. But when comparing the three possibilities, that one seems the least likely. And the truth is, they only accept evidence that lines up with what they've already decided is true, and they ignore the rest. So why didn't we just ignore the soft tissue then, if it's such a slam dunk case against evolution? The idea that scientists ignore evidence that they don't like is not compatible with the idea that they are coming up with these wild explanations to explain away evidence that they don't like. Remember, the people coming up with these explanations are the same ones discovering the evidence. Dr. Schweitzer herself has been involved with most of the publications that explain how this is possible in a 68 million year old fossil, and she was part of the team that first examined the bone. If this were such clear-cut evidence against evolution and scientists just ignore and or hide evidence that goes against evolution, then why did Dr. Schweitzer neither ignore it nor hide it? But we're all supposed to just accept that as science because they told us, even though they haven't shown us. The latest paper in this saga is open access. You are free to read it anytime you like. You can even check its references, look at their data, see pictures of the tissue in various stages of their experimentation. Sure, it's a technical paper, so it's a bit above our heads, but you can feel free to go get yourself an education that will bring your understanding up to a point where you can decipher the more technical parts of the paper. But no, you'd rather sit at that cute little dining room table in the cornfield, pontificating about how incredulous you are at the idea that a scientist would expect you to actually look at the science instead of throwing around wild accusations of conspiracy and fraud. And we keep finding it. Matter of fact, when, they, when you ask the scientists who find these things, they actually say that it's so rampant, you can literally go into a museum, pull out a drawer where these dinosaur bones have been for hundreds of years, break them open and find dinosaur DNA and material that's inside of them. That's how rampant it is. Yeah, really? Is that what they say? Because everything I've read on the subject up to this point has been saying that it is only found in the bones that are the most well-preserved. Is it more common than we originally thought? Yes, but it's not just inside any bone you feel like cracking open, and nobody is saying that you can find DNA in these bones. Well, 
mostly nobody. I've been waiting for this particular item to hit Creation of Circles, and I haven't seen it yet, so I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that Raw Matt wasn't just exaggerating and claiming that they found DNA when it was really just microscopic collagen particles, and I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he is actually aware of the study published in June that purportedly found dinosaur DNA remnants inside a hadrosaur bone. But while the media is hyping this up as a dino DNA discovery, it is more likely bacterial DNA as a discovery just after that one found that bacterial colonies can survive inside fossils that are completely isolated from the outside. So you get an entirely unique line of bacteria that can't be found elsewhere, isolated inside a dinosaur fossil, potentially living for millions of years, and leaving their own DNA remnants behind when they die. But as this discovery was first published about six months ago, we are still in its infancy. After all, it's been 16 years since the soft tissue find, and they're still researching it. So there is still a lot of work to be done here. But at the end of the day, the same thing applies to this DNA find as applies to the soft tissue. Either several entire fields of science are completely wrong about everything, or we may be wrong about how long DNA can be preserved. But even if this is what Raw Matt is talking about, and I definitely have my doubts about that, the title of the paper is Evidence of Proteins, Chromosomes, and Chemical Markers of DNA in Exceptionally Preserved Dinosaur Cartilage. Notice the key words, exceptionally preserved. Does that suggest to you that you could just grab any random dino fossil from a drawer in a museum, crack it open, and find DNA in it? A lot of atheists, when they had heard this, they discredited the, the person who came out with it, a fellow evolutionist. Okay, I'm really enjoying the irony with this one. Yes, Dr. Mary Schweitzer accepts the theory of evolution. But, fun fact, Mary Schweitzer used to be a creationist, a genuine bona fide young earth creationist. But through studying paleontology, she came to realize that evolution is, in fact, true. And while she remains a devout Christian, she is no longer a young earth creationist. And apparently leaving creationism had a rather high cost for her. She lost her friends, her church, and her husband. Which is an unfortunately all too common story among ex-fundamentalists. And ever since the soft tissue discovery, young earth creationists have ridiculed her for supposedly ignoring this clear evidence of a young earth, when that is the position she started with at at the beginning of her paleontology career. Even if you were to put dinosaur soft tissue inside of an airtight jar, that was in another airtight jar and another airtight jar, deep time will always cause things to deteriorate. So there's no way that it could have lasted 65 million years. Read the damn papers, Matt. They're not behind paywalls. All you had to do was some incredibly basic Googling, and boom, you now have your explanation as to how they could last that long. Don't be lazy. It's lucky that it even lasted a thousand years. I mean, you look at animals that die out in nature today, they decay almost right away. Except for the ones that don't. Do you personally keep track of every single organism that dies on the planet? Do you know for a fact that none of them got buried in any type of sediment? No dogs burying bones that they forget about later? No mudslides? No floods? Nothing like that could possibly happen to anything today, right, Matt? Well, here's what the Bible says about dinosaurs. Now, remember, Job apparently never saw a dinosaur, according to these people. I mean, it is hard to see a dinosaur when you yourself are a mythical character who likely never existed. Not even in the wishy-washy, the character of Jesus was based on a real guy kind of existed. Job 40, verse 15, it says, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. So the Bible says that whatever this creature is, it was made with Job. It was the same time frame. Sure, I'll just go ahead and grant that the Bible says that animals and humans were made around roughly the same time. Though that certainly isn't a compelling argument for, well, anything. He eateth grass as an ox. And they say, huh, see, we gotcha. That's not a dinosaur. It ate grass. Sure, I have said that. In fact, I remember having a bit of a laugh last time when Matt read that it eats grass while showing a clip of a dinosaur eating not grass. He eateth grass as an ox. It's funny how you say that it eats grass, literally as you show a video of a sauropod eating not grass. They dug up dinosaur feces, which I don't know how it lasted 65 million years. Fossilization, Matt, come on. At least pretend to learn the basics. It's actually pretty much the same as for bones. Rapid burial, preservation, permineralization. But they discovered dinosaur feces, and they tested the feces of the dinosaur, and guess what the dinosaur ate? Dinosaur dung is full of grass. Okay, Mats, listen up. 
I'm about to say something that you could really learn from. Pay attention now, this is important. When I said that dinosaurs didn't eat grass, I was wrong. My bad. Whoopsie. This was discovered in 2005, and when I researched the topic last time, I didn't have the specific claim of grass found in dung, which led me directly to the articles about the 2005 paper. So instead I ended up at a lengthy paper that goes over the evolutionary history of the grasses, but was published in 2001, several years before the grass in dung discovery. So I was wrong. But it is such an insignificant point that it doesn't really warrant pulling down the video I was wrong in. I'll just go ahead and issue a correction and a pinned comment. So, Matt, now that you've seen an example of someone admitting when they are wrong and updating their view as a result, can you maybe start doing that when you are shown to be wrong? That falsifies grass evolving after dinosaurs. Gra dinosaurs lived 65 million years. Grass evolved 55 million years ago. Dinosaurs ate grass. Congratulations, you can do basic math. What do you think you are proving here? Grasses tend to live in environments that are not conducive to the fossilization process, so their fossil record is rather sparse. Dino poop is also rare, and up until 2005 we hadn't found any that contained any grasses, so we had no reason to believe that grass had evolved yet. Yes, finding grass in dino dung does falsify the idea that grass didn't evolve until the dinosaurs died. And that's all it falsifies. What point are you even trying to make here? Which one is it? It's that grass evolved before dinosaurs went extinct, obviously. Why do you look so smug about it? Do you guys really think that this is some major blow to evolutionary theory? He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Yay, we get to talk about the biblical on, so to speak. Probably not. It moved its tail like a cedar. You guys know of any creature that moves its tail and it's as big as a cedar tree? There's nothing like that out there except a brachiosaur or a dinosaur. No, I don't know of any living creature that has a tail as big as a cedar tree. Now, can you point me to a Bible verse that actually says it was as big as a cedar tree? Because that one says it moves like one. Trees sway in the breeze sometimes, Matt. Plenty of animals out there wag their tails around. But I have talked about how the word translated as moveth there is a bit ambiguous before. Long story short, it could also be translated as extends or made stiff. And given the context of the next sentence talking about its testicles, it stands to reason that making it stiff as a tree is a Verse 18 here. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. That doesn't fit with the sauropods, who all exhibited unambiguous pneumaticity. That is, their bones were filled with air pockets so they could be lightweight, and it helped with breathing. Doesn't really compare well with bars of iron, does it? God is nowhere in the law of thermodynamics. But you, didn't, you weren't really able to tell me what those were. Oh my god, Matt, him not being able to tell you what they were off the top of his head does not mean that you are right about whatever the f Nope, God is not in the laws of thermodynamics. Fair enough. To be very clear, science, not my area at all. Oh my god, Matt, you left that clip in the movie? Why would you do that? You could have just accused me of lying when I said that he told you that, and you could have accused him of lying when he said it, and it would just be your word against ours, and your congregation would eat that. and then played that clip in the movie where you keep coming back to science-related questions. Come on. Also, oh my god, Matt, is that a QAnon bracelet you're wearing? What is even going on here? Is this whole video just a Q code for something and that's why it seems so stupid? And that's it. The dinosaur section is over. It's now completed. At least he didn't bring up the Ica stones again. Shame he didn't go into detail about how he knows the cedar reference was actually to a tail and not a euphemism for a penis. I guess we'll never know. Free thought compares both sides of an equation. Evolution is the only theory protected by law. It's not so much that it is protected by law, rather, it's the only theory that has been legally challenged, and so the courts were asked to make a ruling on it. You don't have laws pertaining to the teaching of gravity, because nobody objects to the teaching of gravity. Except some branches of flat earthers, but they don't have enough influence at the moment to warrant any legal action to protect legitimate science from them. 
Really, the legal protection amounts to we teach science that is understood to be accurate in science class. Creationism is not understood to be accurate, so we do not teach it. Which means that you're actually not allowed to free think outside of evolution. Apply that statement to any other scientific theory and then ask yourself if you would want your kids going to a school with that attitude towards science. I want my kids to go to a school where they teach both sides of the gravity debate so they can free think outside of gravity. After all, gravity is only a theory. It's less well understood than evolution and plenty of people question evolution. When it comes to science, school is for learning science as it is currently understood. The free thinking part comes in at the higher levels of education where you are expected to make new discoveries and come up with new ideas. But it's hard to make new discoveries and come up with new ideas unless you first understand the current discoveries and ideas, which is what elementary and high school are supposed to teach. If you have to have laws to protect your scientific theory from scrutiny, what does that tell you about your theory? Nothing. But if you have to have laws to protect a scientific theory that is better understood than the theory of gravity, while well, you don't have to have laws protecting the theory of gravity, then what does that tell you about the people who oppose that scientific theory? Are you really allowed to be a free thinker? Yes. Now this is actually anti-education, because to have a good educational technique, to have critical thinking, you have to teach both sides of the issue. When there are two sides to an issue, yes. Evolution is a settled question, though, scientifically speaking, so there is only one side. Are you suggesting that it would be good education to entertain a student's objections if they showed up to a physics class refusing to accept that acceleration is equal to delta V over T? I'm sorry, but entertaining unscientific ideas in a science classroom is not a good education. Actually, scratch that. I'm not sorry and allow the student to decide for themselves which one they will believe. In a religion class, sure. In science, when scientific topics are understood to be accurate, you teach the students the accurate science. Anything less is a bad education. What we cannot do in a lab is we cannot create life. We've, we've tried every possible method, and we can't do it with all of the most high-tech instruments in the world. Do you guys remember back in Science Falsely So-Called when Matt demonstrated a perfect example of a goalpost shift with this very question? And in fact, they've never created life. So let me ask you this. So you're saying scientifically we've never created life? Well, even if we did create life, wouldn't that mean there was an intelligence behind it? There have been several instances of artificial life being created in a lab, at least one of which was done with man-made nucleotide bases, that is, base pairs in the DNA of the cell that are not found in nature. When the raging atheist seemed about to point that out to you in Science Falsely So-Called, you immediately moved the goalpost to ask the question, ah, but doesn't us creating it mean it was intelligently designed? But that takes the air out of your whole point. You have mentioned several times that the origin of life must have been so simple, and yet humans can't do it. Well, we have done it. We haven't done it in a way that demonstrates abiogenesis yet, but we have created life in a lab. The trouble with abiogenesis is not that we can't figure out the mechanisms behind how basic life works. The trouble comes in when trying to figure out what the environment of the early Earth would be, what chemicals would be available, how they would interact with each other, etc. In other words, not knowing how it happened in nature does not necessarily mean that we don't know how to do it ourselves. But now we have Matt, two years later, saying almost the exact same thing to Ethan as he said to the Raging Atheist, all without appearing to have even looked into the matter any more than he had the first time, despite getting pushback the first time. So you think that what couldn't come alive in a laboratory, could, under controlled environment, could come to life in a violent prehistoric environment? Saying it's not possible right now doesn't mean it's not possible. So you're putting your trust in something we have not yet discovered. I can't speak for Ethan on this one, but for me, it's not about putting trust in something that we haven't discovered. It's about not putting trust in wild speculation about supernatural events for which there is no evidence. 
Life began at some point. We both agree on that. But where you, Matt, are saying that we don't quite know how it happened exactly, therefore it must have been magic, I am saying that we know that life is basically, when you break it down, a series of chemical reactions. So there's no reason to think that the origin of life wasn't also a series of chemical reactions. We see life getting simpler the farther back in time you go. Abiogenesis is a reasonable extrapolation of that pattern. Magic is not. I'm just not... I I'm not putting my trust in the theistic explanation. Yeah, I'm not going to believe in your claims of magic without evidence. So until you show me some evidence of your magic claims, I will accept the scientific explanation as it is currently understood. That is the reasonable position to hold. Really, as you use cause and effect reasoning, starting with the humans and argue back, where did humans come from and where did life come from? Ultimately, they do believe that minerals, by some random chance process, probably in water, uh, came together to form life. Wow. Wow, Grady. Just wow. I have no other word for it than that. But this, this is a stretch. This is really, really stretching hard to try and make the line, evolutionists believe we came from rocks, true. But it is not true. The closest you can come to saying that it is true is that iron, a mineral, was probably involved in the reaction that turned hydrogen cyanide into simple sugars that would have continued reacting to form simple organic compounds. So yes, minerals were involved in the reactions, but the first life was not made of minerals. So no, by no means could you say that we came from a rock. The first life made use of minerals in chemical reactions, probably in ways similar to our bodies today. So if you can call this first life a rock, then you can call us rocks, because minerals like iron are entirely necessary for our biological processes today. Now, there's a big contradiction to that, because water destroys biological uh, molecules. Uh, the, the big contradiction is that also oxygen, if molecules are trying to form in the presence of oxygen or in the presence of water, then they are destroyed faster than they could be made. Right. That is one of the problems, which is why ponds or lakes near volcanoes are one of the suggested places where life was most likely to start. As water evaporated and the rain brought it back, the compounds could concentrate. As to the oxygen, free atmospheric oxygen is a byproduct of life. There wouldn't have been much, if any, of it around to cause problems for the first organisms. It was actually probably the increase of oxygen in the atmosphere as a waste product that caused the first mass extinction event, as oxygen would have been toxic to most life on the early Earth. Life cannot come from non-life. That's a law of science. It's the law of biogenesis that life cannot spontaneously create itself. Nope. Biogenesis is not a scientific law. This has been a creationist talking point since pretty much immediately after Pasteur published his experiment that showed that boiled broth won't spoil if you isolate it from organisms that make it spoil. Creationists unreasonably extrapolate this to say that life could never ever come from non-life, despite no such thing having ever been demonstrated. And I still have yet to hear a creationist accurately describe Pasteur's experiment, because if you actually look into it, it becomes painfully obvious that it didn't even come close to attempting to address the point that you were trying to claim that it addressed. And so according to evolution, or according to atheism, life would have had to come about in the water, DNA. Well, RNA probably came before DNA, but according to creationism, life would have had to come about when God breathed on some dirt. Chemical reactions that we know are possible happened on the early Earth seems like a better explanation than God breathing on dirt. Again, oxygen and water destroy things like DNA molecules. The whole idea of evolutionary thinking is simply falls apart when you take a look at it and look deeply. Which is why I'm sure you'd never find a Christian with scientific credentials studying such obvious nonsense when they have God as the perfect explanation, right? So Dr. Paul Rimmer of Cambridge University must not exist since he is a Christian who designed an apparatus called Star Lab at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, whose purpose is to simulate plausible early Earth surface environments with the goal of increasing our understanding of the origin of life. The first sentence in his biography is that he is primarily exploring prebiotic chemistry proceeding from hydrogen cyanide and other feedback molecules at high concentrations in surface environments. Here he is talking about how methodological naturalism fits into his worldview. There's this philosophical idea of teleology, of there being some sort of telos or end or goal. 
And I could see there being a sense in which philosophically God provides that sort of thing. But that sort of thing really isn't accessible to that kind of methodological naturalism. That's, that's not something that you could empirically see. So you can have a complete empirical explanation, but you can still look to God for the sort of uh, deeper meaning or purpose behind why things unfolded the way that they did. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that this highly qualified origin of life researcher understands the chemistry better than both myself and Grady McMurtry here, whose secular studies stopped at a degree that was related to forestry management. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. So we're seeing the opposite of what they say happens. What are we supposed to believe? Fairy tale pseudoscience or what we actually observationally see? So just to be clear. You are currently calling origin of life experiments that have shown that the chemicals that make up life can be formed in plausible prebiotic earth conditions, fairy tale pseudoscience. And you're calling the idea that God made a man sculpture out of dirt, breathed on it to bring it to life, and then ripped a rib out of him to build a woman out of what we actually observationally see. The projection is strong with this one. I mean, I'm going to go with what I see. That's why I was an evolutionist and now I believe in creation. So the guy who was once convinced that he could live off of nothing but air and mystical energy now believes in young earth creation. Color me shocked. Genetics is where the war against evolution is actually won, and it's won with genetic entropy. So genetics, the science where we can literally map out our evolutionary relationships using multiple different independent methods, is the place where the war against evolution is won. Using an idea that is not very well accepted, one could argue that it is almost universally panned by geneticists. Well done? Genetic entropy is one of the single strongest modern scientific arguments against evolution. And given how weak it is, and the fact that most geneticists disagree that it's even a thing, the fact that you think it is one of the stronger lines of evidence is quite telling. Because in genetic entropy, which is really the second law of thermodynamics as applied to genetics, as you copy information, you will inevitably destroy it, lose it, corrupt it. Errors are introduced during copying, yes. But an error does not necessarily destroy or corrupt information. But you know what? By all means, continue to promote that idea. Then my argument that the Bible is corrupted because of the simple spelling mistakes and copy errors of the scribes becomes much stronger than it actually is. So either you are wrong and genetic entropy isn't a thing, or you are right and the Bible is unreliable and corrupt. That's exactly what occurs in genetics. When you copy previously existing information, you have only two choices. You can either copy it perfectly or imperfectly. And so what happens is over time, genetic information is lost. It is not gained. How are you quantifying information here? You do realize that mutations are reversible, right? It is functionally impossible for a copying error to always be a loss of information. If I write the sentence, Steve Anderson kicked Matt Powell's balls, and then someone copied it out but misread my handwriting and so wrote the sentence with one letter difference, Steve Anderson licked Matt Powell's balls, is this a gain of information or a loss of information? Well, you could say that it's a loss of information because the original intention of the sentence was lost, but genetics don't have intentions, so that doesn't really apply here. It is different information, certainly, but how do you quantify it? And then if a third person copies it out again and misreads it again, thereby changing it back to Steve Anderson kicked Matt Powell's balls, did this decrease the information again? This happens in genetics. A mutation in one generation can be reversed in the next. But if a mutation is always a loss of information, then that means that the mutation back to what it was originally is another loss of information. And that just doesn't make any sense. So either mutations can introduce new information or they are not reversible. Since they are reversible, then that means they can introduce new information. We're seeing that mutations are causing cancer and disease and a degradation going on inside the human body. It's the exact opposite of what evolution needs. Yeah, those are called detrimental mutations. There are also neutral mutations, which do nothing and make up the vast majority of mutations, and beneficial mutations, which impart some sort of survival advantage, such as the ability to digest lactose into adulthood. That's a mutation. ApoA1 Milano is a mutation, which has a protective effect in its population from heart disease. Or the LRP5 mutation that gives higher bone density and protects against broken bones and osteoporosis. Today, because of the Human Genome Project completed in April of 2003, 
we know that we're losing one to two percent of our genetic information as human beings per generation. I'm sorry, what? We're losing one to two percent of our genetic information per generation? How'd you figure that? What is your source for that? I did find an article on a tech website that points out that humans appear to have less overall genetic material than Denisovans, and they in turn had less genetic material than modern chimpanzees have, which would suggest that humans are trending downward in overall amount of genetic material, but it doesn't say how much, if any, is lost per generation. It in no way suggests that this is some irreversible process for all organisms, and it relies on comparisons with our evolutionary relatives in order to make that conclusion. So if evolution is not true, then neither is this information. But that's the only thing I could find even hinting at us losing genetic information over time. And is this 1-2% to number specific to humans? Because humans have a mutation rate that is about twice as fast per generation as fruit flies, but fruit flies have a much shorter generation time, which can be anywhere from 7-19 to 19 days. So if they lose 0.5% of their genetic information every generation, then that would mean, conservatively speaking, that they would have less than 1% of their original genetic information left in their genome after less than three years. You'd think all of the experiments that have been done on fruit flies that have lasted longer than three years would have noticed such a drastic and significant drop in genetic information. One wonders how fruit flies have even survived long enough for us to experiment on them. And if the rate is not the same in each species, then one is left wondering, are there some factors that maybe come into play that can mitigate the effects of so-called genetic entropy? Are you taking these factors into account when discussing the human genome? My guess, based on the general low quality of the research in this video so far, is no. Now we are the approximately 250th generation since creation, roughly 6,000 years ago. The truth is we shouldn't even be here. The amount of information that's being lost should in fact have caused us to become extinct. In other words, according to both your math and my math, your model doesn't work. So rather than conclude that your model is flawed, it must be God magically making it work. You either have to believe that somebody created the universe, which is consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Sorry, but how is God consistent with thermodynamics? A being that doesn't have any energy input somehow has access to an infinite amount of energy which he can use to do whatever he wants? I mean, unless you are claiming that God has an energy source that is greater than or equal to his energy needs, but then where did that energy source come from? If you want God to make sense from a thermodynamics perspective, then you're left with an infinite regress. Or that matter and energy created itself from nothing, and that it poofed into existence magically. That's a false dichotomy. There's also the idea that space-time would have broken down before the Big Bang, leaving a time with space but no time, ha, see what I did there, making the concepts of both beginning and eternity kinda nonsensical until time first began. There's also the bouncing cosmology idea, which has a potentially infinite number of universes existing in sequence. There's also the idea that nothing is unstable, and it actually takes energy to keep nothing in a stable state of nothingness, so thermodynamics at that point would dictate that a universe would then come into existence. Magic need never enter the equation. And so, atheists will often accuse Christians of believing in magic. Magic. Noun. The power of apparently influencing the course of events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. Creationism, by definition, is a belief in magic. Unless you would suggest that you either understand the mechanisms that God used to create, thereby removing them from the mysterious category, or if you no longer claim that God is supernatural. I doubt you're willing to abandon the supernatural claim, so you're left with finding the mechanism that God used to create the universe. Yeah, you can say he spoke it into existence, but until you figure out exactly how sound waves propagating through the medium that was apparently there before the universe existed caused the universe to come into existence, it's mysterious. It's magic, by definition. But here's the thing. Anybody that believes that matter and energy could create itself believes in magic by default. That is a magic act. Good thing that's not what I believe. What do I believe? I believe that we don't know and are currently working to increase our understanding in that area. Is withholding certainty on a position until there is enough evidence to warrant a conclusion a belief in magic by default, Matt? Do you think like an explosion out of chaos produced order? I, I don't know. I do not think that. The Big Bang was not an explosion for one. Do you believe in the Big Bang? Yeah. As far as I've 
uh, understood it, yes. That's an explosion out of chaos. What chaos, Matt? Are you calling the singularity chaos? I've never heard it described that way before. I mean, the Bible definitely refers to chaos at the beginning. So, Matt, if you accept the Bible, then you believe that everything came out of chaos. But that's not how the Big Bang works. Let's grant your argument that somehow nothing could create everything. That wasn't his argument, Matt. That was your misrepresentation of a scientific position, which, when asked about how it worked, Ethan's response was, I don't know. You can't take I don't know and turn it into, well, actually, this is what you believe. I don't know just means I don't know. So the second law of thermodynamics is an excellent argument proving that evolution is not true. No, it's mostly just an argument that proves that creationists don't understand the laws of thermodynamics. It proves that you start with a complex and end up with simple. That's exactly opposite to what evolutionary theory, or as I put it, evolutionary religion says. Nope. The second law of thermodynamics, at its most basic, says that heat transfers from hot things to cold things until eventually everything will be the same temperature. I'm not sure if you noticed this, but there's a really big hot thing in the sky that transfers a lot of heat energy to the cold thing that is the rock that we live on. Well, the dust that we see in space actually proves creation. Now, there's two aspects to that. If we are taking a look outside the solar system, out into the galaxy and in between galaxies, the dust in the solar system, which we can measure, is being pulled by gravity mostly into the sun because the sun represents 98% of all the mass in the solar system. And that dust is being pulled in, but the dust does get accumulated and pulled in by the gravity of planets as well. But if the solar system were as old as evolution's claim, then it should be dust free. OK, so that description was mostly accurate ish. Well, perhaps not the part about all the dust being pulled into the sun. As it turns out, most interplanetary dust is small enough that solar wind ends up being the dominating force which determines its direction. And so it gets blown out of the solar system. But yes, some of it does end up falling in close to the sun and being lost to evaporation and then turning into solar wind itself. Now, when you say it should all be gone by now if the solar system is billions of years old, are you taking into consideration the fact that it is regularly replenished by colliding bodies like meteors and asteroids, planetary outgassing, and the interstellar dust that our solar system is constantly passing through? Comets coming in close to the sun from the Oort cloud are a regular source of replenishment for the dust in the inner solar system, while collisions provide plenty of dust for the outer solar system, with loss of larger body mass into dust occurring at a rate of about 10 tons per second. We can even identify the different kinds of dust, find their sources, and learn more about the solar system that way. But sure, if we started with a finite amount of dust and no new dust were created or came into the solar system from interstellar sources, we would expect to be out of it by now. But since that isn't even remotely close to our actual situation, which has many sources of dust, we do not expect to see no dust. Also, someone go find Lyra and tell her that we found the source of dust. What is the most important question we can ask? Where dust comes from? The, the rings around Neptune, the rings around Saturn are lumpy. Now, what does that tell you? It means that they're not old. It proves that they are young. As a matter of fact, the rings that you think about are actually very active. And the rings that are closest, for instance, to Saturn are actually being sucked into the planet and being destroyed. The rings at the outer edge are being thrown off into space by centrifugal forces. If the rings around Saturn and Neptune uh, were in fact old, they would be completely smoothed out by now. And again, there's an astonishing thing happening here. You're right. Saturn's rings do appear to be quite young when compared to the 4.5 billion year old planet. Now, scientists discovered this by essentially dive bombing Cassini into Saturn and taking precise measurements of the gravitational effects in several locations, thereby determining the mass of the rings with a lower mass pointing to a younger age. I'm not entirely sure where your claim about them being sucked into Saturn on the inside and cast off on the outside comes from, and quite frankly, I don't care, because the fact of the matter is, Saturn's rings are quite young, relatively speaking. They are an estimated 10 to 100 million years old. So in terms of our solar system, they're just wee little babies. Now, there was one hypothesis in the church that would have the rings of Saturn being significantly younger still. The idea was that Jesus' foreskin ascended into the heavens at the same time as Jesus himself did, and it surrounded Saturn to form its rings. 
And I'm being serious here. That was an actual idea proposed by a 17th century Vatican librarian named Leo Alatius in his unfortunately unpublished work, A Discussion of the Foreskin of Our Lord Jesus Christ. So the idea that Saturn's rings are younger than the planet itself seems to have come from the church. I mean, not really. It doesn't follow at all that people were taking this seriously and that's why they started investigating it. But let's grant this one. That means that the one piece of scientific discovery that actually had its origin in something theological is that the rings of Saturn are young, with the theological reasoning being that they are literally made out of God's foreskin. I will happily grant religion that one point. But they are lumpy. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Jesus had a lumpy foreskin. God flooded the world 4,400 years ago and killed every single living thing on the planet. And after saying that, you still think he's the good guy, discount Jerry Falwell Jr.? And the only thing that survived was two of each kind uh, of animal on Noah's Ark, and his family got off that boat and they repopulated the world. So there was an incredibly severe genetic bottleneck, an event that can be seen in the DNA of an organism, for every terrestrial animal species on the planet just 4,000 years ago? Is that why we have found almost zero bottleneck events that correspond with that? In fact, the closest one I could find is that humans actually did apparently suffer a bottleneck somewhere between four and 8,000 years ago. But the catch here is that it's only on the male side. The female side did not show any change in diversity. It is hypothesized that this might have coincided with the shift from hunter-gathering to agrarian societies, where social hierarchies would have allowed more powerful males to have access to more females than their subservient counterparts. So, for instance, if someone like King Solomon existed with 700 wives and 300 concubines, that's a thousand women that are not having babies with other men, and a potential would have been before that, my point in bringing it up is that it is not without precedent. So really, at the end of the day, there is no species-wide genetic bottleneck that fits the time frame. Whole whales have been found throughout the United States on the top of mountains. Well, I don't know where you're getting this, they're found everywhere across the whole United States thing, but certainly there was one found in California. There is one more that I am aware of in South America in the Andes Mountains. This is exactly the same as the creationist argument about smaller marine fossils on mountaintops. It's just more dramatic because it's a whale rather than small mollusks. Rare as it is, it has the same explanation. The animal died, was buried on the seafloor, and then tectonic activity raised the seafloor up to become the mountains that we have today. Here's the thing about whales. Because they're so heavy and fat, when they die, they float. Remember earlier in this video when Matt said, It is shocking that in 2020, with all the information that we have and the ability to Google things, that people even believe in evolution. Well, literally the first result for the question, do whale carcasses sink, is the Natural History Museum page called What Happens When Whales Die. Literally the first sentence is, whale carcasses take decades to fully decompose and can provide food for an entire ecosystem on the dark depths of the ocean floor. In other words, not only do whales sink, but there are entire ecosystems that depend on whales to die and sink so that they can eat them. Now, does every whale carcass sink? No. Do they sink immediately? No. But they do sink, and it is well before any of the bones have a chance to decay. There's literally a term in marine biology called whale fall to describe when a whale falls to the deeper zones of the ocean and the carcass basically creates a micro-ecosystem that can last for decades. And when they float, their carcasses start immediately being eaten. They would be eaten by birds, by sharks. You can watch it on YouTube videos even today, they watch a whale that dies. It's being consumed rapidly. The former breatharian Raw Matt says that they get consumed rapidly. Marine biologists who spend their entire careers sometimes studying this exact phenomenon say that a single whale carcass can sustain its own ecosystem for decades. Whom should I believe? In between the layers of the Grand Canyon, if they were slow to form, we should expect to find animal holes. So, like these fossilized burrows found in the Bright Angel Shale layer of the Grand Canyon? 
Trees would have grown in the layers, plants. So, like, these fossilized plants found in the hermit shale layer of the Grand Canyon? Wouldn't you expect to find roots in the layers? Okay, so I didn't find anything about roots being fossilized in the Grand Canyon. That's one out of three. But, I mean, the Grand Canyon has several distinct ecosystems piled, one right on top of the other, ranging from sea to desert and a bunch more. Point is, you are looking for very specific markers of very specific creatures from a very specific ecosystem that you think should be there. And, well, two out of the three of the things you said you were looking for are actually there, and the third might be as well, I just didn't see anything in my quick search. But the geology and the fossil evidence together paint a very vivid picture of the different ecosystems that are represented in the Grand Canyon, and none of them point to a worldwide flood. The seas that cover that area were mostly of the shallow variety, and fossilized raindrops and mud cracks toward the younger layers of the formation wouldn't be possible in flood conditions. What about fossilized seashells up on the top of Mount Everest? See my previous answer regarding the fossil whales in the mountains of the Americas. How'd they get there? Evolutionists say, well, they were, they were pushed up through millions of years of plate tectonics. Oh, so you actually know the explanation? Huh. Well, I mean, I have no doubt that you've had that explained to you before. I guess I'm just surprised that you actually told your congregation about it. The clams that are found there are closed. Now, they have a particular protein that's in them that when they die, it gets released and it, it forces them to open. There's no way they can stay closed. Well, it's hard to find specific information on that because the search results are all clogged with cooking advice telling you not to eat any clams or mussels that are open when you get them and don't close when you tap on their shell. I did find a site that went over the myth that you should discard any mussels that don't open when you cook them, because that doesn't mean they went bad or anything, it's just that the heat of cooking can have a different effect on the mussels that hold the shell closed. So, yes, mussels and clams do tend to open when they are dead. But it's not because of some protein reaction like you're saying, it's because of decay. They have ligaments that tend to push the shells open, and they have to exert their muscles to hold the shells closed. So when they die, the muscles relax and the shells open. But as as we have learned from cooking, there are circumstances under which they can remain closed after death, and I would think being buried under sediment would be one of those circumstances. It's not difficult to force it to stay closed, being buried in mud or sediment seems adequate to accomplish that. And notably, the fossilized sea creatures on Everest show signs of having been in a well-established marine community, as in they weren't just swept up there in the flood, they were living there in an established ecosystem, and this has been known since at least the 1600s. And on top of that, the physics of a flood would not lift the bottom-dwelling marine organisms to the tops of the mountains because that's not how physics works. They would be swept down into the low places. So, yeah, I guess superficially you could say, look, I found water critters on a mountain, that means the mountain must have been underwater, but any amount of cursory research into the matter will explain why that's not actually the case. Ooh, this section is called polystrata fossils, which I would have thought, and my spell checker agrees, that it would be polystrate fossils, but whatever. How much do you want to bet that the only definite examples of polystrate fossils are going to be trees? Polystrata fossils. We got trees that broke off in the flood. Yep, there you go. Trees. The only polystrate fossils that creationists have been able to find are a type of organism that is known to stand upright for sometimes centuries after its death, and they only penetrate through types of layers that are known to form rapidly, like volcanic ash layers. If one single global flood event caused all of the rock layers to form basically simultaneously, you would expect polystrate fossils to be the norm for essentially all plants and animals, not an exception for a very specific subset of plants. So, since we know how these form, and we aren't surprised by the fact that the only organisms that have ever been found with a fossil crossing multiple strata is of a variety that is known to stand upright for significant time periods after it dies, I'm going to go ahead and skip to where they bring up a non-tree example of polystrate fossils. Oh, would you look at that. I ended up skipping the whole section. Hmm, what a shocker. Ethan. 
It's not hard to figure out that the law of cause and effect states that for everything that comes into existence, there is a cause. I mean, if we're talking scientific laws, then it's actually really hard to figure that out. Because when looking for it, you're most likely to find wooey new age stuff talking about using the law of cause and effect to send positive vibes out into the universe with the ultimate goal of improving your life. There is no scientific law called the law of cause and effect. And so therefore the cause of the universe if it created time, must be outside of time. If it created space, it must be outside of space. If it created matter, says the law of cause and effect. So what do you even mean by outside of time and space? Are these coherent concepts? Is it possible for something to exist outside of time and space? Why could the causes not be internal? And even if every word you just said is true, why does the cause have to be a god, in your opinion, and how do you draw the line from this nebulous universe-causing god concept to specifically your version of the Christian god? Where does it specifically state that in order for this to be created, it, something outside of it has to create it? Do you, think unconsciousness, do you think unconsciousness is going to cause consciousness? Have you ever observed that? Do I have to personally observe something in order for it to be true? And Matt, you're talking about the cause of space and time here. He asked you a specific question about the origin of space and time. Why are you now pivoting to cognition? Is it because you don't actually have an answer and you know you're just talking out your butt? No, I am. Why would you believe that? So you'd have to believe that it was a conscious being that created consciousness. Why would I have to believe that? I mean, if we want to break it down, neither a sperm nor an egg are conscious beings, and yet from the merging of these two cells comes a conscious being. So from that perspective, yes, we see consciousness come from unconscious beings all the damn time. But you only brought up the origin of consciousness when he asked you a question about the origin of space and time, almost like it's a diversion. I'm skipping the rest of this segment. He doesn't bring up anything that I haven't covered a million times already. The chances for a single protein for a single protein, just one, is 10 to the 164th power. In what conditions? With what transcription mechanism? Or are you talking about in the absence of a transcription mechanism, just a protein forming spontaneously by itself? That statement is entirely meaningless without any further context. Who here thinks that 10 to the 164th power could happen by chance? I really wish that Matt and his lackeys would start wording things in a more gooder way. like. This goes back to the first video of his that I covered where he explains that he grew up in a house where he got taught how to logic. What you're trying to say, Matt, is who here thinks that an event which has a probability of only 1 in 10 to the 164th could happen by chance? This isn't really all that difficult, Matt. But awkward wording aside, I don't think that a poll of a congregation of lay people who don't know enough about science to give you any pushback on your gross misunderstandings is a good source to determine whether or not an event with that probability could actually happen. And I still need to know how you even calculated that probability. Well, I don't know if this is the ultimate origin, but I did find a YouTube video on a channel called Philip C, which talks about the probability of a single protein forming by chance. They also don't explain in that video exactly how they come by that number, but I was able to track down a website that explains the math used to arrive at these conclusions for that specific video. They start with the idea of a protein forming spontaneously by itself. And as I am not aware of any origin of life researcher that points to proteins coming before genetic molecules, that right there is a deal breaker. But let's go on anyway. They start with a protein that is 150 amino acids in length, as 150 is smaller than average, right? Well, right, but we do know of proteins that still exist today in the human body that are shorter than 40 amino acids in length, so clearly it doesn't have to be 150 in order to work. So why don't they use one of those as a baseline? Well, to quote them, some shorter proteins exist, but most of them have simpler roles in the cell, acting as signaling molecules or cofactors. Okay, that's nice, but we're talking origin of life here. Simple is the name of the game. Nobody thinks that the first living organism on the planet had a fully functioning immune system or something. It would have used simple proteins for simple purposes. So right off the bat, they are assuming that life started with proteins, which is likely incorrect. And then they assume that this life would have started with proteins that are about 150 amino acids in length, which is, again, likely incorrect. And with these two incorrect assumptions, they arrive 
arrive at the idea of a protein forming spontaneously having a chance of 1 in 10 to the 164th. But, I mean, if you start with incorrect assumptions, you arrive at an incorrect conclusion. Everything's tending towards chaos. The sun's getting smaller, the moon's getting further from Earth, the Earth is slowing down. Here's the thing, though. Order and chaos are not really great metaphors for understanding what entropy is. Entropy is not a measurement of how much chaos there is in a system. It is a measurement of possible arrangements of the state of your system. If you have a system that is entirely made up of hydrogen gas spread out in a perfectly uniform way, you could swap any hydrogen molecule with any other hydrogen molecule, and it wouldn't make any difference to the system as a whole, so it would have a low entropy state. There's only one arrangement. So why was the principal state of the universe so low on entropy? Well, the answer is that it really wasn't. The reason that entropy has increased so much during the course of the universe is because of black holes. But if we remove black holes from the calculation, today's universe has about the same entropy as the primal state of the universe. Crazy, I know, but that's what the math shows, at least according to astrophysicist Ethan Siegel. Call me crazy, but I think an astrophysicist probably has a better grasp on these concepts than Matt. They always say, give it more time and everything will happen. Like, you know, you can have fish to fishermen over time, bacteria to biologists. Just give us more time. Time is their god. Well, like I said, looking at the universe as a whole, the non-black hole areas of the universe have approximately equal entropy as the primal state of the universe. So yeah, it's decreasing, but not very quickly. Well, at least not quickly from a human perspective. Meanwhile, we live on a planet that is orbiting a star, which provides the planet with a huge influx of relatively low entropy energy, causing the apparent reversal of entropy on the planet itself. So the process of biological evolution does not violate thermodynamics because the Earth is not even close to being a closed system. And what's happened is they've been diluted and lied to, and they're mad at us for telling them that they were lied to. No, if ever I am mad at a creationist, it is for propagating lies themselves. I didn't start out as an atheist, and I'm upset at you guys for pointing out that my whole belief system that I grew up with is a lie. If anything, the exact opposite is true. I was a creationist until I started learning how truly impossible it is to make creationism fit with actual, real, verifiable science. But really, look at this dude's face. This has been his demeanor throughout this entire video. Does that look like a face of someone who's not angry? And yet he sits there saying that atheists are just angry that the creationists are pointing out where they've been lied to. This video so far has been an astonishing exercise in projection. You can even tell if you watch Aaron Ra's stuff where Matt twists Aaron's phrasing just a little bit to make it fit his own narrative, because Aaron is good at coming up with catchy turns of phrase, and Matt's congregation probably doesn't watch anything of Aaron's, so won't realize that Matt is pilfering his stuff. Why? Why are you mad at us? He asks in an angry tone and demeanor. And nothing is more of a destruction of that than the thought of evolution. Their books change every 10 years. They change the dates on everything. They change everything. And they'll tell you, oh, it's because we have more information now. No, it's because you've been falsified or you flopped on something and it has to be changed or, or else you're just going to be wrong forever. This is one of the frequent creationist talking points that I really have a hard time understanding. If evolutionists are lying to promote an idea that they know to be false, why would they need to change? They are the ones making the discoveries that cause the changes. If they are lies, why would they not just lie about the new discoveries to make it fit with the current models and make everything appear more accurate than it actually is? It's not creationist researchers that come up with the new discoveries that shake our understanding of aspects of evolution. It's the actual scientists who understand and accept evolution that are doing that. Why would they make it so hard on themselves? I don't understand how these two ideas can live in your head at the same time. So here's how schools trick you. They come along and they throw a math class at you. Well, guess what? Math is a fact. It's true. Two plus two is four. I don't care where you go. And then they throw you in an English class. Well, everyone's speaking English. That must be true. Um, has this guy ever taken an English class? That's not how English class works. There is a hell of a lot of trying to figure out what the underlying message of a piece of literature might be, and there's a good deal of interpretative freedom in that exercise, where different and conflicting answers can potentially both be correct as long as the students can each explain how they got to that answer. 
I mean, sure, in elementary school, it's mostly about correct spelling and grammar. But by the time you're at the level of schooling where you're going to be English in one class and evolution in the next class, the English class is way more subjective and interpretative than you are portraying. And then they tell you about history and they explain things to you. And then they throw you in this random evolutionary class where everything's subjective and changes all the time. You're confusing evolution with English and art. English and art are the classes where things are subjective and change all the time. Evolution only changes when a new discovery warrants a change. All of those years of school, you think that's going to be easy to break with some guy walking up to you and saying evolution's a lie? You're going to be like, this dude's on crack! Evolution? What are you talking about? We see evolution all around us. The, a baby evolves into an adult. If that's what you think the go-to example is of evolution that we can actually see, then you don't understand evolution. Not even a little bit. But yeah, it's the teachers and scientists that are lying to us, not you. Evolution works on populations. An individual does not evolve. Grass evolves into corn, I mean. That one is actually a good example. Corn really is a type of grass, one where it has been selectively bred to have ridiculously large reproductive organs. Yes, when you eat corn, you are eating the reproductive organs. So are you trying to tell me that a grass species similar to what you probably have growing in your front lawn turning into what we know today as corn over time is not an example of evolution? Using the Hoven test to see if something is the same biblical kind, would a four-year-old look at lawn grass and a corn stalk and call them the same kind? My money is on no. There's, there's so much of a hurdle for us to get over because th what we've done is we've made this generation of people that, that are ingrained into thinking in only one way. So we've raised a generation according to biblical principles, getting them while they're young? Like, I could see Raw Matt being into some wooey New Age stuff as well as creationism based on what I've seen on rawmat.com, which admittedly is not run by Matt by one of his fans. So is he of the opinion that Young Earth creationism is just one aspect of a larger wooey worldview? That's what he seems to be saying here, but I doubt Matt Powell would approve of such a worldview. And evolution is the only way that there is, and there's only one model. Evolution is one aspect of one scientific area. It's a pretty major one, to be sure, but it's not like people live their lives based around evolutionary dictates. And there are multiple evolutionary models depending on which specific aspect of evolution we're looking at. Remember, evolution is a theory. In science, a theory is an entire body of facts, data, laws, and phenomena. There are always going to be areas of every theory that we don't entirely understand. And in these areas, there will be competing hypotheses hypotheses used to explain how we think that area works. That is, different models. And in evolution, this is often the case. Hell, we just learned on Monday about the debate between the evolutionary origin of insect wings and the two most prominent options were presented as a false dichotomy. That's two different models about how that part of evolution works. And they aren't the only two, they are just the two that are seen at the moment to be the most likely. And there's only one explanation. There isn't. There are more explanations, and they can be answered now, and there's more than one model, and our model is so good, it's never been seen before this good. Are you suggesting that creation is the good model? What do you mean, it's never been seen before this good, sick? Creationism hasn't really changed since the 1960s. Every now and again they think of a new argument to make, but for the most part it's all just rephrasing of the same old arguments. The last new argument they got was in 2005 with the soft tissue discovery. But there are new discoveries made in biology that are relevant to evolution all the time. Hell, there's a journal that specifically only publishes papers that deal with the intersection of evolution and molecular biology, called, creatively, Molecular Biology and Evolution. They publish monthly and have done so since 1983, and that's just one of many biology journals that regularly publishes papers that wouldn't be possible if evolution were not true. So which is the good model? The one making new discoveries about how the world works all the time? Or the one that is essentially just a reactionary nuh-uh to all of the new discoveries that they don't like? Even 20 years ago, it wasn't nearly as good as it is now. The only new aspect of creationism that I'm aware of in the last 20 years is the aforementioned soft tissue find. I recommend people reading Replacing Darwin. It does replace the evolutionary model, and it's a really good explanation as to why that model is not good and ours is superior. 
Nah, sorry. I looked at Jeanson trying to promote that book in a Pure Flix interview, and he doesn't appear to have actually brought anything new to the table. He just put a new shade of lipstick on the old creationism pig. If you ask an evolutionist or an atheist, what is the meaning of life? Just ask them that. And they'll respond back with, well, my meaning of my life is whatever I make up. I mean, that's a weird way to say it. I don't think anyone would phrase it as whatever I make up. It's usually more along the lines of, I get to decide that for myself. What they're admitting is that they're making up or make believing a purpose for life. See? You have to purposely reword it in a way that most people wouldn't have phrased it in the first place in order to be able to draw your conclusions the way you want. It's not make-believe, it's about choice. I get to choose the purpose of my life, and I can change my mind about that choice should I decide to at any point. Right now, my life's purpose is to counter pseudoscientific nonsense from creationists. I don't need a god to tell me what to do, and being an eternal slave doesn't sound like a very fulfilling purpose anyway. They don't think there actually is any purpose. Well, which is it, Matt? Do we choose our purpose for ourselves, or is there no purpose? Those are not the same thing. And so they say, well, I'll just make up purpose. That's make-believe, folks. No, that's not make-believe, that's choice. If someone chooses to make helping the less fortunate their life's purpose, and then they go ahead and do a bunch of work to help the less fortunate, they have made a real, tangible difference in the world. Is that real, tangible difference make-believe? I mean, given the common Christian view of focusing on rewards in the afterlife to the exclusion of happiness or comfort in this life, it wouldn't surprise me if Matt was of the opinion that making a real difference in people's lives in the real world were a form of make-believe. After all, what's the point in making someone comfortable now if they're going to be suffering an eternity of torture later? Surely better to let them suffer now but inform them of how to escape the eternal torture later. Except there's zero evidence for the eternal torture or the eternal paradise later. The life we have now is the only one that we have any evidence for. So to someone who doesn't mindlessly accept your claims of an afterlife, letting people suffer for the sake of preserving a life that you can't demonstrate even exists seems cruel. Why is it that some of the least religious places on earth are so sad that they need to take antidepressants every single day? Maybe atheists take their medication at a higher rate than religious extremists like you guys because we don't stigmatize mental health and claim that if you are suffering from depression, it's something wrong with you because if you were right with God, God would fix you. So there are fewer atheists who are in denial about the state of their mental health. Secondly, religion does actually appear to have a protective effect against depression, but what religion it is doesn't matter. Any religion will do. The conclusion there is that having a supportive community is important to mental health, more important than which god you believe in. Which is weird if there really is a specific god who won't heal you unless you believe specifically in him. So just imagine, will you, being someone with clinical depression, that is a real, measurable imbalance of chemicals in the brain that have an emotional impact. And that's a drastic oversimplification of what depression is, there's a lot more factors than just one or two chemicals being at too high or too low levels. Now imagine that such a person lives in a community that is very heavily religious. Lots of NIFB people running around preaching the hateful message that needing antidepressants is a sign of spiritual weakness. You know, the drugs that are designed to help correct the chemical imbalance in the brain? An imbalance the person doesn't have any control over? Now, do you think being stigmatized like that will have a positive or a negative effect on the person? Now imagine this same person, but in a community of people who obviously love them and are supportive to them who encourage them to follow the advice of their doctor. Which one do you think feels better to the person with depression? Notice that for the second community, I didn't say anything about religion. Could be a more liberal church than the NIFB, could be an atheist group. It doesn't matter. Just belonging to a supportive community helps. It doesn't matter what religion or lack thereof that this community espouses. Rhetoric like what Matt is presenting here in his video leads directly to harm, and not just the harm of someone being sad. Harm like 100% preventable suicide. Mental health is an issue that doesn't have to be tied to atheism or evolution, so there is literally no reason for you guys to deny the science that has been done in treating mental health problems. There is no theological salvation issue surrounding mental health. This is just you guys being vindictive and cruel to a population of people who deserve respect and need science-based medical treatment to help them. I would plead 
That is because without God, without a purpose in life, I think that man has to look at himself and say, what am I doing on this planet? No, absolutely not. That is not the cause of depression. Faulty mood regulation in the brain, genetic vulnerability, neurotransmitter levels, improper functioning of nerve circuits, nerve cell connections and nerve cell growth, stress-related suppression of the production of new neurons in the hippocampus, and more are all factors that can potentially cause depression. What's more, the treatments for depression often have no immediate effect. There is evidence to suggest that depression is linked to a smaller hippocampus, and while antidepressants do immediately affect the amount of various neurotransmitters, it takes time for the extra neurotransmitter stimulation to cause the development of new neurons in the hippocampus. Depression is a very complex topic, and each person has their own unique combination of factors that contribute to depression, which is why it is so important to treat depression with medical professionals who can tailor your treatment over time to be more personal and effective for you specifically. Telling people they just need to believe in God harder will not fix the actual medical problems going on in their brains. If anything, it will exacerbate them as they do everything they can to get God to heal them, and they don't get any actual healing and are expected by people like you to act as though they are healed. And since it's possible to hide depression, they may even tell you that they are healed when they are still in need of actual real medical care. Then you wonder why so many people commit suicide. Because assholes like you blame problems that they have no direct control over on them and tell them not to take their medications. And if you need to take medications, then there's something wrong with you that the medication can't fix. This is an incredibly harmful message. All I know exi that exists is evil. So if everything is evil, I must be evil. I must be a product of evil. Dude, you are a member of the religion that says everyone is born in sin, in evil. The atheists are saying that human beings have value and should be treated with at least a basic level of dignity and respect. Atheists are not the ones looking around and declaring everything to be evil. Isn't one of the main arguments that Christians use against atheists that they believe things that Christians think are evil to be good? Things like accepting people's sexuality without judgment, sex before marriage, sex education. Come to think of it, most of the things that Christians disagree with atheists about, morally speaking, are sex-related. Why does the all-powerful creator of the universe get so hung up about what I do with my penis? Doesn't he have more important things to worry about than my junk? Like, maybe he can stop worrying about people's private parts for long enough to, I don't know, maybe cure the pandemic that's having a significant negative global impact on people's lives right now? That'd be nice. You know what foolishness is? Believing that we're related to monkeys and that we're also related to bananas and the grass at the same time. That's stupid. That's foolishness. That's a demonstrable scientific fact. Is it intuitive? Absolutely not. But our intuitions are not helpful in science, never have been. That's why the whole scientific method is all about eliminating our intuition and biases from the equation. There's many people that really believe that the Earth is millions of years old, and they really believe that they came from a dot that exploded magically out of nowhere. There's many people who really believe that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old, and they really believe that they came from a dirt man and a rib woman who were magically made by a sky wizard. See, I can do it too. Do you know what the main difference is between your position and mine? Mine has evidence backing it up. Yours has a myth that was obviously stolen from the earlier Babylonian creation myths, including a lot of the same motifs, even a motif where the new god defeats the old god in battle. That's the whole Leviathan story, and there's an etymological connection between Leviathan and the chaos in Genesis 1, with Genesis 1 being an alternate story with God calming the chaos as being a representation of God triumphing over Tiamat. But I guess that's not the overly simplistic literal reading of the text that you guys like, is it? Heaven forbid we actually put some thought into our interpretation rather than just doing a surface level analysis. They just have no evidence to back it up. You know, dogs are still producing dogs, cats are still producing cats. As is expected and predicted by evolution. Update your rebuttals a bit. You're attempting to make an argument against Linnaean classification rather than cladistic classification. It's not a good argument either way, but it betrays an obvious inability to at least know about recent science. And, you know, obviously uh, there's variations within kinds, but you'll never find an intermediate fossil because they just don't exist because it's just not true. We have transitional nautiloids, ammonoids, cephalopods, insects, spiders, fish, tetrapods, amphibians, turtles, lizards, snakes, pterosaurs, birds, non-mammalian synaptids to mammals, artiodactyls to whales, horses, hominids, 
and a bunch more. Tell me again that they don't exist. These people, like, it just goes to show they don't know the Bible. Quite the contrary, getting to know the Bible is what caused me to stop being a Christian, because reading through the Bible makes it quite obvious that the God character is not someone that I want any dealings with, even if he does exist. And once I took off those rose-colored glasses, I realized that there wasn't any evidence that he does. I probably read the Bible more than most Christians do, even today. Do you know, I don't get Jehovah's Witnesses very often at my door, but when I do, I have never met a single one who knew about the Amalekite genocide. I'd have them turn to it in their own Bible that they brought with them, and not a single one that I talked to was previously aware of the all-loving God's command to the Israelites to slaughter all the people, old and young, infant and child. Sure, there are some spots in the Bible that I'm not overly familiar with, I don't think I've ever read through the Book of Lamentations, for example, but I'm likely to be familiar with any of the verses that your average Christian will be familiar with, and often I know the surrounding context that the Christians don't. So, of course, they come at us when I bring these things up to them with the blanket statements that we've all heard a million times. They'll say, well, you know, must take a lot of faith there to think that a virgin could conceive there, buddy. No, it takes zero faith to believe that. That's actually a key part of sex education. There is a myth that you can't get pregnant your first time having sex, but you can. So yes, a virgin can conceive, but she won't be a virgin anymore after that. And this is where Bible knowledge and context comes into play here, because in the New Testament they use a Greek word that most definitely means virgin, but they are translating from a prophecy in the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah 7.14, in which a Hebrew word, Alma, simply means young woman. It is also possible to infer from context that the word Alma in that verse would be better translated as the concealed one, with reference to the Hebrew custom about the time it was written of a betrothed couple living in their parents' house, but keeping secluded from each other with a woman wearing a veil when they can't be secluded. But I will admit that a woman being a virgin is probably an implication of the word Alma, as it is supposed to apply to a girl who can be married, and the ancient Hebrews considered non-virgins to be not marriageable, but the word Alma could also apply to a woman right up until the birth of her first child, so after the sex but before the delivery. But that is all beside the point, because the prophecy, when read in context, is clearly not about Jesus. It was about King Ahaz of Judah being besieged by Ephraim and Syria in their attempt to pressure him into joining them in a coalition against the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The chapter starts with Ahaz being informed of the alliance between Ephraim and Syria, and being terrified of this alliance when they come to wage war in Jerusalem, but for some reason they can't attack so they lay siege to the city instead. Then God offers a sign to Ahaz that a young woman will conceive and bear a son, name him Emmanuel, and before he knows how to refuse evil and choose good, the two kings that Ahaz fears won't be problems anymore. Since this all took place several hundred years before Jesus was born, it most definitely is not a prophecy about Jesus. It was fulfilled within King Ahaz's lifetime. But how many Christians know the context surrounding Isaiah 714? Not many, I'd wager, and judging by your comment on it here, you don't know it either. You know what? These people think a rock conceived. Yeah. Nope. Not what anybody thinks. You know, and one guy I was in a debate a while ago with this guy, the raging atheist, and he goes, I don't know how anybody could have enough faith to believe that a Jewish man like Jesus would resurrect from the dead. And I'm just thinking, man, you, you think that every living cell came to life out of non-existence. I very much doubt that that is exactly how the raging atheist phrased that. And your response is utter nonsense. Nobody thinks that every single cell came out of non-existence. Abiogenesis is merely the conclusion that, since life is essentially just a cascade of chemical interactions, and it gets simpler the farther back in time you go, the first life would have been very simple, and would have been caused by a cascade of chemical interactions. It's really quite telling that your position is weak enough that you have to constantly grossly misrepresent what the so-called evolutionist position is on things like abiogenesis in order to make your point. I believe Jesus died and resurrected. Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it again into myself. And so Jesus had that power. But to say that you believe that every living life form resurrected from non-living material? 
Dude, look up digestion sometime. That is literally a process that happens in your body all the time. You eat non-living material, your body breaks it down into its constituent non-living parts, and then it incorporates those non-living materials into your body. But what you are claiming with the resurrection of Jesus is that after the processes in the body that serve this function have stopped and have decayed for three days, that decay could magically reverse and kickstart these functions again. Which, come to think of it, if Jesus was bodily resurrected and that restored the function of digestion, does that mean that Jesus still has to poop while he's in heaven? I know that sounds silly, but really, these are legitimate questions that are raised by the resurrection account. If Jesus was raised bodily from the dead, then his body needs sustenance. One of the natural conclusions of eating for sustenance is poop. Did Jesus stop eating and he's magically sustained, thereby eliminating the need for poop? Does he eat but heavenly noses are retuned to make poop not smell gross? Where does heaven poop go? Is there a heavenly throne that flushes all the Jesus poop somewhere else? Does Jesus poop go to hell and smell extra bad down there as an added bit of torture? Another byproduct of digestion is gas. Does the bodily resurrected Jesus burp and fart? That's crazy. That's madness. That's a greater resurrection than I believe in. <laughs> nope, that's literally something that is observed all the time in regular bodily functions like digestion. They want to talk about Christianity being a fairy tale and being a phony story, but look at what they believe. You have to have a lot more faith to be an atheist than you do to be a Christian. If I grant that statement as true, which it's not, but if I grant it as being true, then that means that atheists are more virtuous than Christians, because the Bible treats faith as something virtuous to pursue. The more you have, the better. But of course, the statement isn't even close to true, so yeah, whatever. Believing the gospel is easy. Believing that someone made everything here makes sense. But believing that a, a dot blew up and create everything, and two slugs crawled out of the primordial soup after it rained on the rocks for billions of years, married each other, and then made all the things that you see here. That's a fairy tale. I refuse to believe that these people are actually stupid enough to think that we think that slugs were performing marriage ceremonies. Like, I know human reproduction outside of marriage is supposed to be bad and all, but do they think that animals get married? If not, why would they project that belief onto the godless heathens that they complain keep having sex outside of marriage? Or are you perhaps just being hyperbolic to make our position look worse than it actually is because everyone knows that the idea of slugs performing marriage ceremonies is absurd? If that's the case, then that means you are purposefully misrepresenting our position to make it look worse than it is, which heavily implies that your position is incredibly weak and wouldn't be able to stand up to a comparison with what the so-called evolutionists actually believe. If it could, you wouldn't have to strawman our position, you'd just present it the way it is. So I'll take this as a win for evolution. And that's basically it. He does say stuff over the credits of his video that I could respond to if I wanted to, but it isn't anything that hasn't already been covered in this series. So the whole video that Matt titled The Atheist Religion was all just about evolution, abiogenesis, and cosmology, things that many Christians have no problem accepting and are not religious in any way. And Matt didn't even seem to be attempting to demonstrate that they were religious. I think Grady McMurtry called evolution a religion once, and that was the only time an attempt was made to connect the content of the video to the title. This was basically all just a rehashing of the same tired old talking points that Matt presented in Science Falsely So Called. So I'm done with this one now. Now, uh, I am going to be having Ethan on my channel on Sunday the 31st at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be having a chat about his participation in this movie, whether he feels he was fairly represented, and whatever else he has going on right now. So look out for that. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Tyran Estraza, who says, Funny thing, free will, as defined by theologians, absolutely destroys the law of cause and effect as defined by the same theologians. Yeah, I never really thought about it from that perspective, but usually people like Matt want the law of cause and effect to essentially just be a big chain of causal links, leading back to the moment of creation. But if that is the case, then that looks like it presupposes determinism. So sure, Matt, if you want the law of cause and effect to be a thing, I'll grant it for you, but now you've lost your free will, and so have I. So that means that every choice that I have ever made is a direct result of how God chose to create the universe, which means that God directly causes people to go to hell. It's not their choice to rebel against God, it's God's choice in how he made the universe. 
Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the food whose digestion results in the shit that is my channel. If you'd like to cause my gas, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time.